the technical aspects or are we concerned with the the ultimate decision that resulted from what you would term the supplementation of the judgment? This is Mrs. Uh, no, let me put positions quite clearly. At one level, one can describe the the conditions as technical. The question rises at a broader level, and that's why I said, having introduced the issue, the decision is before this court. At what stage does one say that a judge may not, as you put it, uh, Justice Masutu, interfere with a judgment which has been handed down in public? That's the first question. The second question is, where the public sits and a judgment is given, having regard to the provisions of Section 12.1c, is it a mere technicality to say that a judge may not supplement that? And we submit that question really is the, a, a question of the supremacy of the Constitution and the doctrine of legality. If the Constitution doesn't permit it, then it cannot be done. Let me make this other point, Justice Masita. And, and as I say, it may not materially affect the decision of the court. But let us say that a judge hands down judgment today and the litigant on the losing side wants to appeal and starts preparing his application for leave to appeal. But before he does that, the judge augments his judgment to make it more cogent. The question really is, is that allowed in terms of the criminal law and having regard to the provisions of section 12, or Article 12 once? It is in that sense, though, and I accept that in this particular case, it may be technical. The problem that court faces is, if it permits that, where is the red line that separates what is permissible from what is not permissible. That is why in the Tutor case, the majority said that even the, the attitude given in the Wells case ought not to be followed. It is the judgment that is handed down in public that must be the final judgment. One final thing, uh, Justice Mason. The first judgment was not an extempore judgment as traditionally understood, in the sense that it was uh, handed down immediately or soon after argument. That judgment was handed down 10 days later. The second point and this has not been disputed, is that the judge had prepared a written judgment which he read into the record and is finalizes everything by saying that's the judgment. That's all the application for you. Those are the facts. It's in those circumstances we say it may not be purely technical. Seventy-six of it. Yeah. To what extent do you read it to to limit um, the 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 time the judge can interfere? Just strong. You will recall that in State versus Wells. Uh, said that 
account should be taken of section 176. Now, section 176 says a judgment may be corrected. What State versus Wells appears to do is draw a distinction between a supplementation of a judgment and a correction of the judgment. In my respectful submission, that is not correct. Because if you can't correct, then having regard to the common law, ought not to be able to supplement. That is, but, but the, the, the Wells test has stood since 19, uh, since 1990. And, and so, in, and it was accepted by this court in the cargo case. So I, I do not want to go there, but I take the point you made. Now, as regards the merits, there are four broad issues I want to deal with. And the first is the basis on which the appellants sought bail and the basis on which it was opposed. Then the second one is the fundamental role that the Bernard judge in the court are co-attributed to onus in this particular case and why the decision of the learned judge in respect of onus is wrong, or we submit is wrong. Third one is the approach adopted by the learned judge to the entire bail when one looks at his judgment as a whole, and the last issue is the principal misdirections or material errors of law. Now, as regards the question of basis on which the application was made, it looms large because in this case, one has, in respect of the, the first three appellants, one has their affidavits. And the affidavits set out both in factual form and in submissions, why they submit they were good candidates for bail. They make the following points in regard to their application. Their main point is that at the time of the bail hearing, they had been in detention or in custody for some two years. They say, based on what had been said by Justice Muhammad as he, uh, acting, just, uh, acting Judge Muhammad as he then was, in Atchison's case, that the provisions of 12.1b of the Constitution had been triggered. And it is perhaps useful to, 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 set, uh, to read out what 12.1b says. Appears under the general provisions of fair trial, and it says, a trial referred to in sub article A shall take place within a reasonable time, failing which the accused shall be released. We submit that that being a provision in the Constitution, it needs to be interpreted properly in respect of all matters. And in a sense, as was done by Justice Muhammad in the Atchison case. Now, the second point they make is that the, the first three appellants, the more serious charges that they are facing were investigated on the facts which were not disputed by the Anti-Corruption Commission. They say 
a and e a uh, a proper interpretation of the provisions of the Anti-Corruption Act, together with the provisions of the Prevention of Organized Crime Act, precludes ACC from investigating. So they say that to the extent that the allegation is made that they are facing serious charges, that allegation must be tempered by the notion that they may succeed in the criminal court in persuading the judge that the ACC investigations were unlawful and accordingly those charges cannot be pursued against them. And their argument is based on the principle of legality. I will deal with that in a moment. If I could just ask you to keep in mind, in a sense, adopting what was said in Rally for Democracy by this court and more recently in the competition commission case against Puma Energy, where this court, when it was asked to examine whether the competition commission or whether a particular official in the competition commission could apply for a warrant, said that having regard to the relevant provisions, although the commission itself had the power to apply for a warrant, the official who applied was not entitled to, and it set aside the warrant and all the evidence obtained in terms of it. That's the principal doctrine of legality that is relied on. Then they say that there was evidence placed before the court in their affidavits which made reference to what had been said by the Prosecutor General in the restraint application. And that is a factor that should have been taken into account, namely that Icelandic defendants in the restraint application said the state witness was an accomplice, he had a drug problem, had a mental problem, and more importantly, he was an accomplice and on that basis was unlikely to come and testify. To the extent that it's alleged that there is a strong case, the case is only as strong as the witnesses would testify if the main witness, and it was accepted by Mr. Kanyangele in evidence, if the main witness is not going to be there, that weakens the strength of the state. Then they say that all their assets are subject to a restraint order and they have no assets and in a sense, if they sconded, then those assets would be lost. That is the consequence of the, the relevant provisions of poker. They, then they finally say that it's unfair to require them to prepare for a criminal trial as massive as the one they are facing whilst they are in detention and that that affects their right to a fair trial which is protected by Article 12. Finally, they make the point that whilst they do not enter the merits of the case, they will plead not guilty, they deny any wrongdoing, and state on oath, they will stand trial. Now, one of the points they make is, in regard to the confidence that they have that they will not be convicted, is Helens 1 and 2 were in Cape Town at the time that 
arrest warrants had been issued. They were aware of those warrants. This evidence is not disputed. They returned to Cape Town and the ACC arrested them after their return. All of this is not disputed. Now, in those circumstances, how can it be reasonably contended that they are a flight risk? That's the case they make up. The opposition to the case was as follows, that the appellants face serious charges, there's a strong case, there's a fear that they will abscond and interfere with state witnesses, and in support of, of the, the strength of the case, the, case uh, the state referred to numerous documents which were presented uh, oh, uh, cool. Now, that's the first issue. The second issue I want to deal with is the question of onus. Uh, sorry. Next issue. Um, this issue about the authority of the investigating officer to carry out the investigation. In my opinion, it sounds like it leads to saying that the entire pieces of evidence he has collected is not admissible because he had no authority to investigate. Would that be the proper way to conceptualize no, no. what you are saying? Because at the end of the day, what I don't understand is to what does this lead to where you are concerned with an application for bail or release on bail? It's like you are saying the evidence is of no consequence and therefore there is no strong case to be made. And as a result, uh, the applicants have to be released on bail. Is that what you are saying in essence? No. 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 Just proceed. Look at the affidavits, the applicants, they replicate it. This is the essence of what he said. We are facing charges of corruption. We are facing charges of fraud. We are facing charges of racketeering and we are facing charges of money laundering. Money laundering and racketeering are offenses that are created by poker. Section 83 of poker says that an investigation in respect before any criminal proceedings or civil proceedings, the inspector general must authorize a police officer to conduct the investigation. The ACC are not police officers. The ACC is a separate statutory institution. Well, sufficient to correct. What is the result there of a police? Yes. Uh, the, the, the answer to that is, of course, they are entitled to investigate. The ACC and the investigator is entitled to investigate the, the, all the anti-corruption. So all the evidence he gathered in that respect would be admissible, both for the purposes of the bail application and the purposes of the, the criminal trial. It may well be that to the extent that fraud is related to that, it's also admissible in relation to the fraud allegation. But the evidence that he collects in terms of the of uh, uh, in respect of racketeering and money laundering is inadmissible because he does not have the power. That is that is the submission. But there are two points that I must emphasize, and it's quite clear the judge in the court our co didn't fully appreciate that it was not a decision 
that he was asking to, uh, to make because he didn't have the jurisdiction. Because then there would be two decisions on the matter. When the criminal trial starts, that is the point at which the applicants would ask for a decisive ruling on that matter, on lawfulness of the investigations into money laundering and racketeering. There are two possibilities. That court may say there is no substance in the point, we think it's one continuous investigation, or it may say on the basis of the doctrine of legality, which is a central value of our constitution, you exceeded the bounds of your authority, and therefore, as has happened in the uh, Puma Energy case, we ignore all of that evidence because it's not law. Okay. It's just, it would be no different in substance from if you obtained a confession from an accused person in circumstances not permissible in terms of the Constitution or in terms of the Criminal Procedure Act. So is it purely, but it's not a matter that we asked the learned judge in the court, our co, and careful consideration of our papers makes that quite clear. That has a limited purpose to say that to the extent that the state says the accused or the appellants are facing counts of uh, 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 corruption, fraud, money laundering, and racketeering, leave out two of them. And so it reduces the seriousness of the case against you. That's the whole purpose. But not to say that there is not a serious case. What you are saying in essence is, you are saying the effect of the evidence collected by this unauthorized investigator is such that the accused are going to be confronted with evidence which is unlawful, which is illegal, and therefore this has the effect of saying that the case they are facing is not a serious case. Is that the net effect of the argument? the number of charges they are facing, because the corruption would still be serious, that we accept, but the number of charges that they are facing would be reduced if one... In severity. He, yes. Okay. Because that is a factor that is taken into account even on the basis of access. What is the nature? of the charges you are facing. So if you are, if you are not facing charges uh, of money laundering and racketeering, then court needs to say, well, you are facing charges of corruption and fraud. Is that sufficient of, 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 of uh, sufficient weight to outweigh all the factors I must consider in your Thank you. Now, the question of the onus is a matter that seems to loom large in the judgment itself. Now, at paragraphs 50, and, uh, 50 to 52, we itemize the various instances where that is done. I don't need, I just point it out now to alert, uh, alert justices to the importance 
that the onus played in this matter. For example, at paragraph 51, judge says, an applicant for bail bears the specific onus to prove that the interest of justice permits his release. Then he says, this means an applicant must specifically make out his own case and not necessarily rely on the perceived strength or weakness of the state's case. If you look at paragraph, I mean, if you look at footnote 47, we'll see the reference is to Mate Bula's case in South Africa. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. Then at paragraph 52, we note that the learned judge says, I've come to the conclusion that the appellants have not discharged the onus resting on them to demonstrate that their con continued incarceration is a violation of, uh, of their rights. And then he says, as to whether they will abscond or not, the scales are equal, equally balanced, but because the onus rests on them, I can't rule on, uh, in favor. Now, there are two issues relating to the onus that I want to deal with. Perhaps I should just deal with the Matebula matter, first of all. Now, in his judgment in State versus Lamini, which is referred to, unfortunately, it's not a judgment I included, but you, which is referred to in the uh, in the Dawasif judgment. It's the case is State versus Lamini. It's reported at 1999, Volume Four, South African Law Reports. Page 623, uh, Judgment of the Constitutional Court of South Africa. Now, Justice Crickler there was faced with the question whether Section 11 or, or Section 6011 of the Criminal Procedure Act was unconstitutional. Now, Section 60 of the South African Act, as is pointed out in detail by Justice Crickler in the Zlamini case, Section 60 has been amended to the point where, whilst the uh, Namibian Section 60 has remained largely unchanged, doesn't deal with the question of owners and so on. In South Africa, the position has changed quite dramatically. Uh, in what the value of the Zlamini judgment for us is point made by Justice Crickler at paragraph 39 of his judgment. Makes the point that effectively the matters referred to by Justice Muhammad in Atchison's case, which is what the learned judge, I'm going to come to that point now, says he was following, that those matters represent a collation of the common law rules relating, or the common law and the case law rules relating to bail at the time the Atchison judgment now, that insight is contained, unfortunately, only in a footnote, but it appears at paragraph 39 of Justice Crickler's judgment. What is important about that is that several provisions of the South African, of uh, the, the new South African section 60, is largely a reproduction of the tests 
that Justice Muhammad has laid down in Atchison's case. That's the first point I want to make. But the second point, and the reason I bring it up here is that the learned judge says, in the learned judge in this case says, but the accused bears a specific onus to not rely on any weakness in the state's case. But that is a reflection of what section 60, uh, subsection 11a and b says. And that is why, it was the main reason why an application was made to declare that provision unlawful, because there was an onus that was now cast on the accused to lead evidence, to lead specifically evidence. He needed to, if I could just, perhaps it might be easiest just to tell you exactly what it says. says, notwithstanding any provision of this act, where an accused is charged with an offense referred to in Schedule 6, as the more serious charges uh, 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 set out in the CPA, the court shall order that the accused shall order that the accused be detained in custody until he or she has dealt has been dealt with in accordance with law, unless the accused, having been given a reasonable opportunity to do so, adduces evidence, satisfies the court that exceptional circumstances exist which in the interests of justice permit his or her release on bail. That is Section 6011A. Section uh, 6011B deals with charges under Schedule 5, and instead of saying exceptional circumstances, it simply says that the accused must satisfy the court that the interests of justice permit his release of that. Now, it is that provision which the learned judge in the court, our co, relies on, in relying on State must owe versus matter. But that is not part of the Namibian law. Namibia doesn't have a provision which says the accused bears the owners. That has been part of the development of the law. And it was accepted recently that ordinarily the, or the onus lies on an accused to, 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 uh, to satisfy the court that he is a good candidate for bail. Now, other two cases that the learned judge relies on, paragraph I have said, are State versus Pinero and State versus Dawasib. That the Lordships will find at footnote 46. The Lordship, uh, uh, Justice Frank, you appeared in the, uh, you were the presiding judge in the Nero matter. I know it's a long time ago. But in that matter, having heard an urgent application for bail, Justice Frank, you ruled that the accused had discharged the onus of showing he should be entitled. But there is no, there is no uh, analysis of where the onus lay because the onus didn't matter. The next case, Justice Frank, in which the question of bail arose, but in which you we also a judge with Justice O'Lynn uh, o 
as he was at that time, was in the case of Duplessis. Now, in Duplessis, issue was raised, as noted by Justice O'Lynn in his judgment, where the question was raised with counsel, but does not the new constitutional dispensation create a different basis to determine the question of onus? That court didn't deal with the matter because it said that in order to do so, it would require full argument which had not been given, not been part of the application for leave to appeal, and the learned magistrate had not been able to deal. So that question didn't. The only case where the, que the issue of the onus arose is in the case of, of Dowsack, State versus Dowsack. And in that matter, Justice Hoff dealt with the issue. And we deal with that some detail we deal with that at paragraph 56 of our Heads of Argument. <coughs> it's all set out there, but in essence, the point made in the Heads may be summarized as follows. <coughs> the matter was raised before Justice Hoff in Dowsep's case, the basis that Article 7 of the Namibian Constitution, which dealt with the issue of liberty, required that there be an equality of arms and the state, being the party opposing bail, should be the one who should start and should bear the onus. The learned judge dismissed both those points. As to who should start, that's irrelevant for present purpose. With regard to holding that the accused or the owners, the learned judges, and, and with respect, it is a, a, a well-reasoned judgment on that issue. Then a judge compared the position in South Africa with the position in Namibia, having regard to the provisions I have read to you. And he said that the position in South Africa has been changed because Section 25 of the Constitution entitles an accused to bail unless the interests of justice dictate otherwise. And so it was quite clear the way the onus lay. And then he made the point that Namibia does not have such a provision. And therefore, an accused being an applicant would need to bear the onus. And there is nothing that was before him that made him decide there was something unfair about that except at this level, that he says that because Section 6011 of the Criminal Procedure Act in South Africa places the onus on the accused, and Justice Crickler in State versus Lamini had found that provision not to be unconstitutional, it was difficult to say that placing the onus, not a section 6011 onus, but placing the general onus on an accused is 
not unconstitutional. That's the learned judge's reasoning. I'm perhaps not doing full justice to it, it's, but it's set out fully in our minds. Now, we accept, for the purposes certainly of this appeal, that the learned judge properly applied the law in so far as ordinary cases of bail come before the court. In other words, an accused is charged, he comes before a magistrate or even before the high court, and says, I want bail, and it's a period of six weeks or whatever from his arrest. He relies on the ordinary principles of bail, and those are, that, that is where the onus we submit would fall on the accused. Now, you will recall that at the outset, I made the point that it was important to understand the basis on which the appeal of the appellants were applying for that. Now, the appellants say, that's right at the outset of their respective affidavits, as uh, we'll talk about appellants, it's obviously appellants one, two, and three. They say, we've been in custody for nearly two years. In terms of section 12.1b, that is an unreasonable time, that a reasonable time for the beginning of my trial has passed, therefore my continued detention is now unlawful because that's what section, 60, section 61b says. It says, a trial referred to in sub-article A shall take place within a reasonable time, failing which the accused shall be released. That's the provision on which they rely. We submit that this is different from position that pertained before Justice Hoff in Dowersep's case, and it's different from the position that was uh, that uh, the court in State versus Duplessis was faced. This is now asking the court to look at what are the implications where an accused relying on section uh, on uh, Article 12.1b comes to court and says, "I have been in custody for for 12 uh, for." nearly two years. 12.1b, uh, the provisions of 12.1b are triggered and therefore I ought to be released. Different. To be released from prosecution totally if you look at the Heidendrich's case. That's not to be released on bail or release, I mean that's to be released, end of story, they won't be any further prosecution. That's a specific constitutional right that you must try to enforce with specific requirements. Uh, what 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 I can understand is all the courts, and that's the, also in the Dendrich judgment, Hannah's judgment, says all the courts, of course, have a duty to act constitutionally and to in, enhance the constitution or to promote the objects of the Constitution. And in that context, courts mustn't unduly postpone or easily postpone on behalf of the state and see to it that the trial gets going. But that release doesn't mean release on conditions. It's an unconditional release from prosecution forever and a day. And that's something else. This is, uh, Frank, let me, let me make two points on that. Firstly, that provision was considered by Justice Atchison, uh, by, by Justice Mohammed in Atchison. And interpretation is the interpretation 
I, I have attributed to it. I'm not saying your interpretation is wrong, just, but I'm just saying that the interpretation accords with what uh, Justice Muhammad said in State versus Atchison. But there is a second point, uh, Justice Fred, and of course, comparisons in some sense are odious, but in law, they are very instructive and useful. So if that is, uh, now, I want to read, Justice Frank, to you what the South African Constitution says on this issue. Uh, section uh, uh, 35, 3, and Section 35 of the Constitution deals with arrested, detained, and accused persons. Section 35.3 D says, Every accused person has a right to a fair trial, which includes the right, paragraph D, to have their trial begin and conclude without reasonable. Now, the point I'm making is that the wording is quite different. And if one is talking about the trial, then the Namibian constitution, one would think, would have said that the trial, uh, the uh, the uh, the trial must be dismissed. And 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 I'm just saying that I, I accept, and and I I've got to be frank, just frank. I I've I've not. <laughs> no pun intended. Uh, Expected <clears throat> that within the provisions of the section that says you have to be uh, placed before the courts within a reasonable time, if it does not happen, the expectation is that then the accused person would move the court in order to seek to be released from prosecution because it has taken too long. And the anticipation there, in my view, seems to be that where there are reasons that justify delays, then an accused person cannot resort to that. But where the accused person is aware that, no, there are no reasons for this, I don't see why I am languishing in jail, they will definitely file an application to ask the court and say, this prosecution should no longer be proceeded with. And then in that case, Justice Messenger, there is a way to, to interpret 12.1b to give the accused two rights. One is to be released from detention, and the other is to be released from prosecution. And he can choose whichever one he wants. In Atchison's case, Atchison chose the the, the 12.1b uh, amplified with 12 uh, with uh, Article 7, and that's exactly what the accused have chosen in this case. But Justice Frank, may may I may I respond in a slightly different way? That's not the case we have. If that is the case. The question really is, can an accused not seek less relief than the wider relief that your interpretation gives? In other words, prosecution must be, of course, if the prosecution is stopped by this court, the accused must walk away today. Lesser relief, not the bail application. But that's exactly, but they, they bring the bail application by relying on the right in terms of 12.1b. It, it's, I mean, the, the prejudice to the, the, just to the accused has always been a factor. The, in, the, the in, time in, limit, in, it, as, as pointed out by Mohammed. But the problem is, it, it, we're talking in a different context now, we're talking in the owner's context. Because yes. you want to use 12.1b to, Put an onus on the state. Yes. 
Uh, it, it's, it's, it's the other thing would be in the general Greek consideration where they accuse as an onus. That's one of the considerations that you must take into account. So, and, and, and that is why I, I try to distinguish the reasoning in state versus Dawasip and accept that given the case that the learned judge, as he then was, was confronted with, namely, Article 7, God protects my liberty. Therefore, the, the, the onus is on the state. But where an accused now comes, in, and, and of course, Article 7 says, a person is protected from arbitrary arrest unless sanctioned by law. Now, the sanctioned by law obviously must be read in context because a person is, a, 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 a person is arrested on the basis of a warrant, is brought to court, he's charged. He now, two years later, says, but this is a uh, on the basis of what is contained in uh, uh, Article 12.1b, I am entitled to apply for bail on that basis. If you choose to oppose bail, you show the court why my 12.1b uh, 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 right does not trump your right to keep me in custody. Yeah. And, it, and, and that is why, right at the outset, I made the point that the case is based on 12.1b. And it is, when one looks at it, looks at the case that was made out in court, it is based squarely on what happened in State versus Atchison. Squarely on that. The accusants in custody, <coughs> except for one difference. Except for one difference. In Atchison, he had applied for bail, refused, refusal confirmed by the High Court, and then when he came, when he was uh, arraigned before the High Court, he then applied for bail again. And one of the questions raised, well, we can't do that. Justice Muhammad says, no, but nothing. But that is when he dealt with this issue. Now, I just ask, and I don't want to, boy, uh, and, and I, I accept, Justice Frank, that you've read the heads and, 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 and clearly based on the interchanges all, all, all the justices have. But I just want to make the point that at paragraph 58 our, of our heads, we make the point right in the middle that the court in Dawasip did not consider whether the right of an accused who is not tried within a reasonable time required that the question of where the onus lay in such cases needed to be examined. It is submitted that it needs to be. And that is where we say one of the issues that arise in this case because if the oh, and, 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 and the onus issue must loom large in this case, because as I have pointed out, the learned judge placed so much of emphasis on onus. But they, then this is what we say, and I just want to make sure that I, I make the point properly. Uh, Article 12 provides, uh, 12 b provides a criminal trial must take place within a re reasonable time, failing which the accused shall be released. And the question whether from prosecution or from custody, uh, uh, the, the submission is giving it a pur purpose of uh, uh, interpretation, one would say perhaps both, but certainly can't exclude one. Then we submit that based on the interpretation given 
in State versus Atchison, the right in 12.1b reinforces the right in 12.1, uh, the, the uh, right in Article 7 to liberty. And the point we make in this case is that ordinarily the onus would lie, as found in Dawasip, ordinarily the onus lies with the accused. Uh, however, the effect of 12.1b is to limit to a reasonable time the lawfulness of the deprivation of liberty that Article 7 permits. Article 7 says, provided it's in accordance with law. The further submission is that the combined effect of Article 7 and 12.1b is as follows. A person suspected, uh, suspected of committing an offence may be arrested in accordance with law. He or she may be kept in custody pending the trial, subject to his or her right to apply for bail, not to be released as in South Africa, but to apply for bail in terms of Section uh, 60. Should he apply before a reasonable time has passed, the burden rests on him. However, after a reasonable time has passed, then given the fact that it's the 12.1b is emphatic, the accused shall be released. We submit that if you want to avoid that, if the state wants to avoid that consequence, it bears the onus of justifying the continued detention. Now, just make one final, uh, final point on that score, because that's what was said in Daosep, and we accept the reasoning in Daosep, that the, art uh, the Article 12.1b right to be released after the passage of a reasonable time has passed is no different from the right in Section 25.2d of the South African Interim Constitution or 35.1f of the final constitution, or section 60, what was 60, uh, subsection 1 of the criminal procedure. And so it would be that the onus ought to be on the state. We make the following further points in, uh, uh, in support of this. In Wandini, which is at paragraph 60 of our, our, of our heads, the, this court said, the whole tenor of chapter 3 and the influence upon it of international human rights instruments from which many of its provisions were derived call for a generous and purposive interpretation that avoids the austerity of tabulated legalism. So we say that that ought to apply to the right in 12.1, be read with the right in 12.17. And then, of course, what was said in Atchison, which we quote in paragraph 61, says the constitution of a nation is not simply a statute mechanically defining the structures of government and relations between the government and the governed. Then it says the spirit and tenor of the constitution must preside over and permeate the processes and judicial interpretation and judicial discretion. Point I want to emphasize. The learned judge in the court are called, quoted extensively from Atchison. But this passage he does not quote, and, and, and the relevant, I, I don't say he did it deliberately, but the relevance of that is that in considering the applicant, the appellant's bail application, he was required to exercise the discretion 
And as he set out so firmly in Atchison's case, that discretion ought to have been permeated, the, permeated the, uh, the, uh, by the spirit and tenor of the provisions institution. Would the provision not encapsulated in the Gustavo judgment of this court? where it is put in context how these fundamental rights fit in in the whole scheme of the Constitution, which underlying has a sense of justice or a sense of uh, people must be able to account for their, work, for their crimes, etc., etc. Uh, Justice Frank, I've got no difficulty with that. The, the difficulty in, in this case is that effectively, and that's the next issue I want to deal with. Effectively, there, had, there hasn't been that balance in the judgment of the court of Coke. And, and we accept that it's not only the rights. That's the point that was made in duplicy. We accept that. But the beauty of the duplicy judgment, and Justice Frank, I, I, I say this with respect is, when it was not even raised, your bench raised it with counts. But of course, because it couldn't be dealt with, and the only point I'm trying to make is that one can't compartmentalize rights. The rights are part of a broader scheme of allowing society to continue its democracy in a meaningful way. That can't be done unless those who are guilty of crimes are brought to book. Question really is, this really is a nub of this case. In granting the appellant's bail, one does not say they are not guilty. One merely says that the Constitution says in order to retain a person in custody, these are the conditions that must be fulfilled. But we say that that hasn't happened in this case. Now, can I come, uh, Justice Frank, I sort of hesitated when I s gave my answer to the Gustavo judgment, and, and that's because of the next topic that I want to deal with, the general approach adopted by the learned judge. Now, may I ask, Justices, if I can just ask that you have the judgment in front of you. Because I want to go to, through the scheme of how the learned judge dealt with them. He starts off with the quote from Atchison, which says that an accused can't be kept in detention until uh, as a form of anticipatory punishment. Sorry, we've got so many bundles and stuff. Can you just it's, give uh, me a quick, quick reference? Volume, uh, uh, volume 26, uh, Justice Frank. The very last volume. It's fortunately, the thinnest as well. From the nullity, the null of the boy judgment. So you're referring to, uh, uh, yeah, well, it starts you, with, it's not uh, a... Page four, oh, where the introduction, where the code from Atchison. Yes. I'm then, with you. Then at paragraph 10... Sorry, I just what, want what to... What page did you say you're referring to? It's page 2,900. 2,004. Oh, well, I, I'm, I've got volume, oh, sorry, I've got volume 25, I'm sorry, but I've got the judgment in front of at page 2,900. 
And the I, I will refer to the paragraphs. And uh, it's right at the top. The, the judgment end. starts at 2903 in, in volume 25, which is the same that you were. Yes. Probably two, two copies of it. Yes. The first paragraph is an accused person cannot be yes. held. Yes. I, I just want to emphasize that. Then at paragraph 10, the learned judge quotes the matters or says that in deciding the question of bail, these are the considerations that must be taken into account. Now, I'm ignoring now, because I've dealt with it and I don't want to overstep my time, the question of onus. I've dealt with the question of onus and I say wherever the judge says, the learned judge says, that the onus rests on the accused, we submit in this case is wrong. Then, but what he does say is, these are the cons considerations that Justice Muhammad outlined and sets out the three matters, namely, will he abscond? Will he interfere with the witnesses or, or uh, the investigation? And what is the prejudice to the accused? There, paragraph 12, the learned judge says, having set out the legal principles, I turn to, s to consider the grounds on which each applicant seeks bail. And then he sets these out from paragraphs 15 to 46, just setting out the grounds. Then he sets out from paragraphs 47 to 60 the basis of the opposition. Then from paragraph 61, he, there is the heading discussion. Now, as far as the discussion goes, the learned judge then says, having set out the case of the applicant, the applicants say their constitutional rights have been violated. And then he sets out how one goes about proving that right has been violated. That's at 62 to 66. And then he quotes concerns raised by uh, the court in Duplessis about simply taking matters of the Constitution out of context. But as I say that, those remarks must be dealt with on the basis that the court itself in Duplessis had raised constitutional issues. It just didn't deal with them. And the submission is that that is the balancing act that is required. Rights of the accused and as against the interests of society. That is exactly what Justice Muhammad says in Atchison's case. Ordinarily, an accused should be released on bail unless it is against the interests of justice. And you look at the following considerations. Now, I want to deal now with how the learned judge, having articulated what Justice Muhammad said were the considerations. He says, at, from paragraph 68, for the reasons I have set out, I have come to the conclusions that the applicants have not discharged the honor. And then continues as to why that is so. Then, he deals with the question of the ACC and the issue that was raised earlier and by Justice Masuto, namely 
but where does that get you? And the point I was making, and I repeat, is that if ACC is not allowed to investigate money laundering and racketeering, then those counts may, may not be taken into account in the determination. But of course, and, and I have to make this concession, this court will, cannot make the decision. The matter is not before you. But if you come to the conclusion that the learned judge and the court are cold, the decision is wrong, then we ask you in taking, uh, in deciding where, what the correct decision is, you have regard to the fact that maybe the decision uh, of, the, of the trial of the criminal trial court will be that the ACC is not entitled to investigate. Then the learned judge, then from paragraph seventy-four and seventy-five, says deals with the question of whether they have means to escape and so on. And it says, in my view, the scales as to whether they will abscond or not are equally balanced. I can't make a finding. But because the onus rests on the accused, I must find against the accused. And then at paragraph 77 to 80, he merely sets out various allegations made. Then he says, At paragraph 81. One of the factors that the court must take into account in determining whether an applicant is likely to interfere or tamper with evidence is whether or not a condition preventing communication between him can effectively be, pro be policed. Isn't that one of the paragraphs? You That's one of the paragraphs. Okay, carry on says, the state led testimony that Mrs. Shangalala and Hatikulupi were on two different occasions found with mobile telephone. I ask you, Justices, to consider the quantum leap made between having telephones, cellular phones, in a prison setting and interfering with state witnesses or you, you may say that but I'm not sure they will comply with orders but that leap between the possession of cellular phones and the 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 interference with state witnesses and uh, uh, the interference with state witnesses and the investigation is a problem. Here's a second problem with the whole approach of the judge. The evidence of Mr. Kanyangela was clear. The investigations are over. We are ready to start trial. What interference can there be? Well, people can change the evidence as they come to court as they usually do. They add on a bit here, they forget something there, etc. <laughs> I mean, surely you've been in criminal trials a long time. So. It's hardly yeah. ever a witness who sticks to his, wit yeah. his yeah. witness statement verbatim. You yeah. just forget something that is very crucial, or you add something that you forgot to tell the investigating officer, or a document you had is now but, but, been but burnt out day, somewhere on in a car but, accident. But, but on, ja on that basis, Justice Frank, no accused should be released on that because the cause that possible. I merely say, and that's, that's precisely why Atchison sets out those considerations. And they are so powerful, they've been incorporated into the statutory provisions of a neighboring country. But when it originates here, it is not applied 
by a judge who is bound to apply them and says he is applied. That is the real, the, the essence of the complaint here. Move on to your last misdirection yes. point. You mentioned it also a misdirection in terms of what your submission is, but you can move on. That's, or maybe you're that, doing the two together, I'm not sure. Now, Bernard Judge also then mentions the prejudice to the accused and the inequality of arms by quoting the Botswana case. And then he says, but one size can't fit all. Well, what does that mean? It's exactly what he says. At paragraph 84, while the sentiments expressed by Justice Dingaka accord with the principles of constitutional democracies, one must not forget that life is never a one shoe fits all sizes. But surely that is what a proper application of what was said in uh, Atchison required the learned judge to do. So. When one looks at the judgment as a whole, the entire approach, there is no analysis. There is no weighing up of factors. And yet, the learned judge deprives people of their liberty on the basis of merely a, a iteration of facts. That can't be what the, uh, what Judicial officer asked to decide an important question like that. I have five more minutes, sir, uh, and I'm going to stick to that. Now, may I then say that given that approach, we say the entire approach constitutes a misdirection. It is not what is required by Atchison. It is not what the learned judge said he was going to do. And in those circumstances, there is no basis to hold the, the decision as correct on, for the reasons he has given. There may be different reasons, but that's a different question. Now, I have dealt with the question of onus. I've dealt with the question of the approach of the learned judge. Now I want to deal with specific items and I'm just going to itemize them. Firstly, learned judge says, and I've read that passage where he says, well, Kondo's case, this is what was said. Kondo's case dealt with, and we've set it out in our head, dealt with a challenge to a, the constitutionality of a statutory provision. Now, in Atchison, Justice Muhammad says, seven months, 12.1b, the right to liberty, presumption of innocence. Now, are there any factors that preclude? There's no further evidence. The learned judge, in fact, and we've quoted that in our heads, when our learned friends were arguing, said, and you'll see that in the argument, said, but these accused have been in detention for 27 months. Is that fair? But in his judgment, he says, but you haven't proved it. The question is, what type of proof? Does one say that where a judge, a judge sta stature of Muhammad, has found that seven months is a lot? What does one say that you must, there are secondary facts and primary facts that constitutes a total establishment justices? One of the factors 
that was raised throughout. The reliance that can be placed on Mr. Kanyangelis. Now, the judge at various points says, Mr. Kanyangela, can you walk? Oh, sorry, do you walk? Do you go to church? The purpose of those questions was to simply answer the question because that was the type of witness he was. And there were many, many times where he was accused by me, obviously, of being disingenuous. But he simply denied. But it's all there on the record. Now, there is not a mention in the judgment because that's dealing with the state case. Do you know, Mr. Kanyangela didn't make the best of impressions. Or why, notwithstanding that, he relies on Kanyangela. Here is the way Mr. Kanyangela conducted himself. He is told by the Icelandic defendants we say to you that Stefansson won't come and testify. He doesn't investigate that. Not at all. He comes to court. The question really just, surely that deserves a mention when one is looking at the order. And when one is depriving persons of fundamental like, rights like their liberty, one needs to say that that, uh, that can only be on the word of somebody whose evidence is credible. We, in conclusion, submit, Justices, that based on what is contained in our heads, and we ask that they be taken into account, account of the time factor, not an account of what I said today. Also in answer to questions, it was, we ask that found that the uh, decision of the court our call was wrong, that on a proper consideration of all the evidence, including the legal issues that we raised, and especially the question of owners, that accused be released on bail, made the point in our heads, Atchison set very strict conditions that those are the conditions the justices ought to set. So, okay. Mr. Petella, we are going to adjourn for take the tea break now. We'll adjourn until 20. I hope that watch that clock is that clock correct? Correct enough, not what is the time now? It's more or less. What's the time? We'll adjourn for 20 minutes, and when we come back, it is your turn. So, the court will adjourn for 20 minutes. The state is, however, of a absolute basis for the state, arguing that the state has let it, it has not been said. That the applicants have tried to in this case and witnesses. And this is what I read before. Argue that at least six appellants are all charged with obstruction of justice. One person who was accused, bribe, etc. And then he talks about uh, paragraph 79, the issue of um, communication with a witness and dating of an agreement. I'll come to that. Paragraph 80, he then deals with money in Dubai again. But look at what he's doing. Five and six that they were going to eat separate evidence.
it appears that the court must, the only reason is that the court must have the reason that was given and this is now missing that my friends really granted bail was it, that they would temper with money in Dubai. That's some of my it's nowhere in there. The material change, change which justifies this honorable court. We have this thing, the first point, a sale investment of, of the court of poor, because a litigant in court cannot appear on the date of hearing be told. The reason why your application is unsuccessful is one. And then later on be told that it is too late. That goes to the issue of the finality of judgments. The court was formed to office. It is not an amendment, your lordship. It's a material change which justifies nothing but the assailing of that judgment by the owner of the court. And if it's a mistake, and, and I'm happy you asked that question, your lordship, because Justice Shongwe also asked that question to my pertaining to section 1779, 176. 176 is very clear. There must be a mistake. Mistake? Yes. According to you, there was a mistake. An error. I'm saying, if the judge acknowledged that it was a mistake, he should have said so in the written judgment. That there was a mistake in the previous judgment. I'm now accordingly correcting it. And it must be done timelessly. It must be done promptly, according to section 176. Or anyone can take the next step. Surely it doesn't mean they must do it now. Immediately is okay, we'll go out of court. Lord, we may differ as to the extent of the promptness. <laughs> yes, but if I came to you after 10 days after I've realized the mistake as a legal practitioner, and I say I apply for condonation, it's prompt enough, you would not be satisfied. It would not. Talking about you or me. Yes. Talking about <laughs> promptness and up yeah. to when can you rectify a mistake? Yes. And because you know the final, final one will be your final judgment because that's the one that you're going to publish on whatever webs, whatever they publish. Yes, Your Lordship. Let, let's accept that, it, you know, in such an instance, a, a mistake can be corrected. What does Wells tell us about the correction of mistakes or capital dynamics? It's something relating to a cost a clerical or a typographical. This is a substance of the reason for giving a judgment. It's beyond a mistake as we understand it. It's a fundamental departure from the previous judgment. So whether the first judgment or the two judgments, you know, whatever the reason, this judgment cannot be left as it is because it made a fundamental error. Now, let me deal with whether even on that basis, and I provided the court with that basis that to clump together all the applicants that appeared before the court to say information that applies in respect of one, two, three can be used to clump them all together without even so much as an explanation. That on its own creates a fundamental and fair conclusion by the court. It was never the case that they had to face. So even if it was not a you know, even if it was a correction in terms of section 176, which we say it was not, even if it was, the entire basis for that finding is fundamentally erroneous. More so because in court, the court was always clear, and I refer to volume seven, that volume seven that I asked the allotships to, to pick out earlier, Page 721, right at the beginning of that volume, the first transcribed page. 721, volume 7, page 721. This is what the court actually was alive to the fact that, and I refer to the middle of that paragraph where the court says the following. 
volume 7 your lordship so maybe sorry it's another one Yes, this is my lord. This is what the court stated during the proceedings. And this was at the time when appellant number four was in the witness box testifying. Now remember, bail is an inquiry process. It is an individual process. The evidence and the documentation that is being used in support of Mr. Ngepunya's application or in opposition simply applies to him. I cannot take those documentation and use it to determine whether I must allow the release of applicant one, applicant two, or applicant three on bail. The court was alive that if you have an issue in respect of this particular applicant, deal with that evidence or his testimony and raise those issues with him while that person is on the witness box. It is a great injustice that my clients were never confronted. They were never called to answer the question whether they are refusal to bail related to anything happening in Dubai. Nothing. And that is a fact. On what basis then does the court of law go and brush them with the occurrence and the affairs of the money in Dubai when that was never the case they were faced to answer? Even in our administrative law, what are thou? Not in a court of law. What are thou? Every person has a right to be heard. Every person has a right to address the information that is being preferred against that person in order to determine whether that person should be treated favorably or not. And my clients were not given that right. So that, that reason, even if it was sustainable on one or more grounds, it's a fundamental injustice which this one of the court we submit should not allow to stand. Now, I will quickly move away. Let's see if there are further questions on why we submit that the two judgments in respect of appellant four, five, and six, they create an injustice. Um, but furthermore, I will now zoom into the facts. Assuming we are with you, um, what would be the effect of your saying that this latter part that appears in the subsequent judgment is prejudicial to your client. Should we expunge it or what? And if we were to do that, what consequences would that have in respect of the conclusion that the first judgment arrived at? Look, um, I could be opportunistic and say that on that basis alone, throw away everything and grant my client bail. In fact, that would be the ideal situation. That's what I want. That's why I'm here. Those are my instructions. To apply that the judgment be offset and my clients be created bail. But I have even better. What I will do now, give you a plethora of all the crowns. I've given you just one now. I have more in my bag. And once I'm done with all those, then I'll make submission to the court that looking at all these considerations that I have so far, this judgment in respect of appellant 4, 5, and 6 cannot stand. They should have been granted bail by the court of law. That's the conclusion that I'm making. To. But let me move now quickly because I'm also mindful of the time that, that, that I've been allocated by the owner of the court. These appellants, your lordships, They saw bail. They went in the 
box. And they testified why they are good candidates to be admitted for bail. All of them. I'm saying appellants four, five, and six. They gave oral testimony. What did they do? They never took any excuse, technicality, or otherwise. They answered every question that was preferred against them. Not only by myself, by the state's council, as well as the court itself. They answered every question, including on the substance of the state's case about them. I will deal with those. Moreover, they actually explained why in their views the state's case against them it is a mirage. It's not as strong as it looks. They were challenged. They were cross-examined on every aspect of their defense. They never made any excuse. What is the implication of this? I will deal with it when I answer their logic question regarding to the Gustavo matter, the criteria laid out in Gustavo matter. Yes. Please don't explain what you're going to come to. Just carry on with your argument. Yes, correct. Right. Uh, so, when we look at all this, um, we we submit that in our heads, for example, your know, chips. We have dealt at length with the factual matrix. We try to avoid legal tautology. We wanted to deal with the factual matrix. Why they should be granted bail. One of the, the high watermark of the state's factual case that was presented against Mr. Ngipunia was the fact that he contacted one witness. This witness is called Mr. Jose Ramon Camano. We deal with this from paragraph 28 of our heads of arguments. But please, Look at what the court found in regard to Mr. Kamal. The court says, in paragraph 57, 57 of that judgment, the written, the written judgment, yes, 3020, that is volume 26 of 26. The, the thin one, Justice Frank. Volume 26 of 26. The last volume of that. Paragraph 56 of the written judgment. Yes, paragraph 57. 57. And this is very critical. I'll spend a little bit of time dealing with it. During his testimony, Mr. Kanyangela, that is the investigating officer, referred the court to a witness statement by a certain Jose Ramon Kamano, stated that during November 2019, Mr. Ngepunya contacted him to sign a consultancy agreement between Skeleton Coast and Wanyamba Investment Trust. And, and this is very important, your logics the last six words of that sentence and to backdate it 2017. Once you are the court, you conclude that somebody was asking, A was asking B to backdate something, automatically it triggers the tentacles that something improper was happening. It questions that person as not being this, less than honest, a dishonest individual, a person who cannot be trusted. We have looked at the statement of Jose Kamal. He says, he simply says, let me tell you, volume, which is in volume 11 of 12, that is the exhibits, volume. Nowhere in that statement, Nowhere in that statement does Ramon say that he was asked 
for back date and agreement. No way. This evidence was before the court. Not the opinion of the investigating officer, not the submissions of the state, the actual statement itself. Volume 11. 11 of 12. Oh, with the exhibits. Yes, of the exhibits list. In case you want to verify that, uh, it starts on page 1205. 1205. 1205. All that this gentleman says is that, and you look at paragraph 40 of that statement, paragraph 40 of that statement, which is on page 1216. During November, during about November 2019, Mr. Ngepunya called me about the consultancy service agreement he had wanted Novanam to sign for consulting services. He rendered to us. A copy of the agreement is attached here to and marked JR153 to JR160. <coughs> That is what that statement says. Let's continue to the next page. Mr. Ngepunya told me that the agreement would offer him and Novanam a form of safety. Moreover, he sent a draft agreement to me by email. I cannot recall the exact date when I received it. I told him that I would forward the agreement to Novanam CEO, Miguel Todesilas, as I did not have the authority to sign the agreement. For Lord Chips, you can read through the entire statement, including from paragraphs 47 to 50. The request to backdate the signing of the agreement is nowhere to be found there. The investigating officer in his overzealousness could have said that, but the statement was before the court. When the court draws and makes a finding that my client requested a witness to backdate, that is interference. Backdating is interference. It's a lie. It's dishonest. That finding is not supported by me. And the court should not have made that finding. On that basis, we submit that the finding of the court is not supported by the actual facts that were before it. That's not what this witness statement says. So where does the court get the notion that, or the conclusion that this person was asked to backdate the agreement, not only backdated, but to a specific year, which is 2017? With the greatest respect, this fact, this finding, this conclusion of the court played a great mind in justifying the court to say, if I release you, you are going to be interfering with people to backdate agreements. It was never in dispute that, and that time laid out a full context and the basis that at that time when this person was called, even Ramon was not even a witness at that stage. He was called because the agreements were still there, and just like they were been happening 2017, 2018, 2019, because his auditors were on him to say, we need these agreements to be signed. So every year he would send the agreement. He never said the one of 2019 backdated to 2017, the one of 2018 backdated to 2017. That is a misdirection on the facts. And it was so material because it justified, if that was established as a fact, it would have justified the refusal of the bill. The way we understand what interference is, there is nothing wrong if a witness is known to X, Y, for them to communicate on other matters, except relating to the issues that are before court. There is nothing wrong to say, can I borrow money from you? There is nothing wrong with that. But once a witness says, change that information so that it suits this and do this and X, Y, that, that creates an element of dishonesty. Yes. My Lord. Having made that point, I also point out that this issue as well, uh, if I can just conclude on this point, Your Lordship, this, this issue that of big dating agreements was never even traversed. 
with Mr. Nyebunya by through cross examination or by the court itself while he was in the witness box, that you have asked witnesses to make date agreements. He was asked on other things except the actual aspect that is material to play the aspect of, uh, of interference. And if we go to our heads, we, we deal with all that information about interference. This is what Ngepunya said in the witness box. In our heads, we relate to this in paragraph 33. He denied that he is a potential interferer or obstructionist. He actually said this is not true because I have never tried to interfere with any witness since my incarceration. Of course, the consultancy agreement and the communication you are referring to was before the allegations against me and I was still a member of the public going on on a normal course of life. Of course, now that I'm here applying before the Honourable Court, I've also indicated in my prayers that one of the conditions is for me not to communicate with any of the witnesses. And he was not challenged on this, that this is impossible, that it would not be easily policed. Nothing at all. The assumption, if a witness in the witness box and he's not challenged, the assumption is that the court accepts that what he says is true. We submit that the analogy by the investigating officer should not simply have been accepted, or the summarization or the submission of the state council. You know that he backdated agreements to 2017, while the court had primary statement before it, it would have been considered otherwise. So, your lordships, if you look at from page nine of our heads, that's where we deal with the factual metrics upon which the appellants place before the court. What is more painful, your lordships, or much more concerning? Let me just say in my submission, there, there is not even in testimony, even in the court, if you look at this judgment, not even a referral of appellant number six. Why was this gentleman denied refuse bail? There is no evidence that the court cites that influenced him regarding his egregious behavior while he was out or in prison. Appellant four, five, and six, while they were in prison, they were not found with anything. There is no allegation that they acted unwards. So we say, when we look at the facts, there is a huge concern in the manner in which they have been summarized, uh, which raises a lot of questions about the correctness of the, and the understanding of the, of the facts by the court of court. One of the issues that I want to point the honor of the court to is paragraph 79 of the court of court judgment. The state further led evidence that is in page 10, uh, 3027 of the written judgment. The state further led evidence to the fact that the fourth applicant prior to his arrest, uh, first arrest after his arrest and while in custody, used an unauthorized device to communicate with a witness and persuade that witness to sign an agreement uh, which will give him protection. The issue of an unauthorized device, we see it for the first time in the judgment. Because that alone justifies the conclusion that this appellant was involved in some nefarious activities, including having unauthorized devices involved in prison. There was never any evidence like that that was left. In fact, the commander officer of the Bento Correctional Services came to testify before the court. It was available to the state. Nowhere in his testimony does he say prisoners are waiting trial in the circumstances of appellant four, five, and six do not have access public forms supervised by the Vento Correctional Services. 
nowhere in this testimony or in the state testimony do they say there is no other access to any phone. So the only phone that they could have is if it was a law phone. But the further crew seemed to accept this conclusion which is not gravitated on fence. And this information was used to deny four bail. I've already said in the judgment, other than when the court summarizes the testimony of Mr. Philip Swaho. Sixth, appellate. Nowhere does the court actually mention what was the Ekrekia's behavior about him, why he could not be admitted to bail. We say the other two, at least there was mention, albeit a weak one, because when one interrogates the facts, they don't look to that conclusion. More probably not even a simple mention. We are also officers of the court. When we have to explain to clients, you were denied bail, and the client says, why? What do I say? The court of court should have given his reason. The fact that there was no reason given is because there was no cogent reason why he was not given bail. And it is for this court to correct that injustice. We submit that if you look at the totality of the facts that we have dealt with in our, in our submissions, which I don't want to reiterate page by page because I got the assurances from the court that you have looked at all the record, including our submissions and the heads of arguments. Um, we are there, every question was answered. Each of these three defendants did not just reach a conclusion that that is my defense. They came to court, explained each page. They preferred viable defenses that are sustainable in law. And in many respects, those defenses were not challenged. They were on record saying the, 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 the transfers of money, the invoices that the state is relying on, on several and numerous occasions. Some of them are just duplicates of one invoice, which your investigators similarly have compounded into these huge amounts. They have said when we were dealing with, in respect of appellant for when I was dealing with all this allocation of the quota, I had the instructions from the owner of the, of the quota, which is the government. Not only did I stop there, I will also make sure that I'm holding it down to the last ton. And I provided a report to the appropriate authorities. He preferred his defense. He did not run away from any of the issues in respect of four or five as well. The same defenses were raised. That they were just ordinary business people. They delivered what they delivered. They were asked to provide services and they had to invoice for those services. There is nothing wrong. It has never been a sin to do business in this country. And that is their defense. They have not hidden behind any technicalities. That is their defense on the facts of and the thrust of the state's case. This is what worries us about the jurisprudence that is coming out of all this. It's very, and I'm saying this in respect to the Gustavo Meta. Uh, the facts of the Gustavo Meta are very, very different from what happened in respect to this particular three appellants, four, five, and six. And why do I say so? In the Gustavo Meta, the court placed reliance on two fundamental factors in the determination of the strength of the state's case. The court said, the reading of the investigating officer's evidence established a prima facie case against the respondent. Key to this consideration is that the investigating officer's allegations remain largely unanswered as the respondent had declined to answer several questions put to him in cross-examination, mainly on the basis that he had not yet received a full disclosure of the evidence to be tendered at the trial. This takes these three appellants outside of that class. They declined and they went into the jumping horse of cross-examination and they answered every question there. There is no finding 
anywhere in the judgment that they are unreliable, they were liars, or they are, you know, in fact, the court does not even go into that. So how then does the court... Because he was accused himself. <laughs> Sorry, my lord. It's just as well he didn't make such findings, otherwise you would sit with another accuser. Yes, my lord. Uh, uh, yes, so, but, but these are the factors that are important, my lord, for the determination of the strength of the state case. It cannot be a one-sided determination. If you look at what the state says and you rely on it, let's walk the type of fairness as well and look at what they the accused or the appellant says and what is his defense and what do I make of his defense. So we see a criteria which completely annihilates or overlooks in the court of court judgment, which overlooks. test and the case that was and, and, and the veracity of the defendants or the, 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 the appellants the, four, the three appellants case and therefore we say on that basis it automatically that takes us outside of the facts of the Gustavo matter who said you inside the Gustavo judgment I nobody said this facts fit in with yeah. the Gustavo judgment it's yes. something that you it's a skittle that you put up and that you've now demolished so you can I thought I should, uh, I thought I should zoom in if it was not, I, you there asked. Are things in the Gustavo judgment, like your point about public violence is the only thing that's covered by public interest, is no longer a point on that. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, we, we submit that, my lord, um, insofar as, 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 as that judgment is concerned, it certainly cannot be relied upon by this court as, um, as, as authority for the reviews are of appellant four, five, and six uh, to be granted bail because there are circumstances and everything is very different. My Lord, I prepared thoroughly on this, so I'm a bit uh, hard done by that. I cannot go into the details that I have provided. And, and we say, my Lord, uh, in this instance, my Lord, if you look at the, 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 the thrust of the issues that we have raised in our heads and the summarization that we have done of our of our facts, there is one no doubt whatsoever that there was no proper base, no proper base, no yes, that's that you in your justice, and I'm saying that one or two matters that I want to conclude for my lord uh, if you can just bear with me my lord i just need to we, we submit that our courts have always said that it is not appropriate for a court of court to while the investigating of the opinion of the investigating officer uh, certainly are some factors to be considered but the court should still make a decision not to rely ipsa exit on that opinion that is not sustainable I should not just rely on those opinions that are not sustainable on the face. So uh, the court reliance on, on the opinion of the investigating officer here could not have been correct. Uh, simply put, my lord, we say and we submit that the issue of the strength of the state's case does not arise in, in regard to this particular appellants, but also the the threat of interference with your witness. We, we acknowledge that there was a testimony led and there is a witness statement that said that he was contacted on this particular day to sign an agreement. That witness does not say he was contacted to change his version of his testimony or... Oh, yes. That's Ramon's thing. Yes, my lord. The, the, large deed. Yes. Lastly, my lord, um, I want to, to refer you to one or two authorities, uh, one of which you said on which is the case of... Uh, yes, my lord. Throw them back at me. Yes, my lord, I, I see. <laughs> um, I would like to refer you to the case of Likani, Freyrema, first of all, S versus Likani. Uh, the second one is uh, Freyrema, S.A. versus the Prosecutor General. And Um, 
No, ma no, te ho voluto da su parte a... Because it's my judgment. No, no, te... Te ho voluto da su parte a... One for me and one for There is one copy for, for all the objects and then for our colleagues as well. Lord, what is interesting in the in the case? Why did you suddenly get out of these cases that you wanted to run? Is it some light burning and that light came on the last week or something? Not when I feel the pain of my client's continued detention, I spend sleepless nights trying to find whatever can assist us. Yellow chips. In the case of Likanyi, at the tail end of that judgment, Likanyi meta S versus Likanyi. God, Likanya, yes. Okay, yes, my Lord. May I refer to the last, last paragraph of that judgment? <laughs> Please do not look at the quorum in that judgment, Lord Chips. But the last paragraph of that judgment, paragraph 190. I'm raising this to say that. This is a minority judge, not, not binding on any, not even on me anymore. I rely on that on that judgment, my lord, because I believe it can be sufficient to persuade the allotees. What had happened in this case? The, the court referenced not um, Denny in his famous works, uh, the family story at page 172 of that of that book, where he wrote with reference to a painful story of one man, the Seneca story as follows. Paiso sentenced a soldier to deal to death for the murder of Gaius. He ordered a centurion to execute the sentence. When the soldier was about to be executed, Gaius came forward himself alive and well. The centurion reported it to Paiso. Paiso then sentenced all three to death. Number one, the soldier, because he had already been sentenced. Number two, the centurion for disobeying the orders. And Gaius for being the cause of the death of two innocent men. Paiso excused it by the plea, fiat justicia rua coelum. Let justice be done, though the heavens should fall. I take this analogy and say the continued detention of my clients, four, five, and six, even in the circumstances of this matter where we have pointed out that the judgment itself is erroneous, would be equivalent to what this historical figure Paiso did in this matter, to say, tough luck, let justice be done, even though heaven should fall. Please submit your lordships that there is a perfect opportunity to basically also reference what my earlier, my learned friend earlier referred to when he was making submissions on the purpose of the constitution. And for that, we reference the words of Justice Tradom and Frank in the matter of Freyrema SA, that's as the Prosecutor General of. And we refer you to page 24, 24, 24 of that judgment. 
where after looking at all the relevant authorities, it's in the middle right. That, that, that I was looking at the bottom of the page. You know, my lot is hidden in the armpit of that, uh, that page. Uh, where the court dealt with how the court must approach the chapter three rights, the fundamental rights in the constitution. And the court said it must be broadly, liberally, and purposely be interpreted so as to avoid the austerity of tabulated legalism, and so as to enable it to continue to play a creative and dynamic role in the expression and the achievement of the ideals of the, and the aspiration of the nation. In the articulation of the values bonding its people and in disciplining its government. And we say this because we all uphold, including the appellants that are before the court, the notion that where people are accused of corruption, it is in the interest of society that these people be prosecuted and dealt with according to But the means should not justify the end. Where people such as appellant four, five, and six are and looking at the facts favorably should be admitted to me. The courts should try as much as possible to uphold their right to bail, unless there is a real risk, a real risk of undermining the justice system. That is the risk here. We look at it objectively and we submit that is not at all. The investigations are complete. In fact, the full state's disclosure running into 608,000 trials has been discovered disclosed. The witnesses have all put a version under oath with the consequences of the law. They have put their version in their witness statements. The risk is about probability, not possibility, because possibility also is about how remote it is. We say it's very remote that they can be interfered with. They have already put their version before the court. And therefore, we submit your logic that this is a perfect case upon which the court should uphold the rise of a for five and six. Years. And it was a very dramatic uh, reference to work from Gaius or Cicero. <laughs> but if I may summarize, you say, you say the court committed a couple of misdirections or a number of them, not a couple more. Number of misdirections for that reason, the court's judgment will be set aside. Then, of course, if we do that, we must decide. If we, if we do that, we must decide whether the bail should be granted. Because yes. then we must give the decision we would have given. Yes, and you, you perceive that in that situation, the proper appraisal of the evidence leads only to one conclusion that they won't interfere, they won't abscond, and they won't interfere with witnesses. But what about, despite all that, the public interest or the interest of... And you, in your heads, you say that's basically the interest of justice in any event. Yes, sir. So what about the public interest? If there's just the likelihood of a problem, shouldn't we, in a case like, serious case like this, say, no, hang on a bit. This is a case where we can't take any chances. And it's not a real likelihood. There must just be a likelihood, surely. Because, I mean, we all know that bail applications and bail decisions are where judicial officers go wrong. It's a very difficult thing in this space. You know, you try and look at the, the law and so forth. It's very difficult to project what's going to happen in the future. Your yeah, Lordship, we can use the past. Use the past, factual past, to judge the future. Because none of us have a crystal ball. 
Yes, you don't have to elaborate because I know you people were called and they came and presented themselves and all that kind of stuff. They've got family, I know all that. I'm, I'm giving you the facts here, point. In respect of nature's form, when the state was investigating these crimes against him and they reached and all they could not find information, they called him. He had already been suspended from his job. He was in the north of the Republic of Namibia. He not only cooperated with them, he directed where they could find that information. He cooperated. So, did you do once you looked at, you say, I can't, I, they've established A, B, and C. They're not going to abscond, they're not going to interfere. And they've been in, they've been there for a while, so it's pretty prejudicial to them. But that's not the end of it. Next inquiry is, is it in the public interest? Is it not in the public interest? I mean, you can't say I must now consider the same factors that's been considered under the normal circumstances. Isn't then to this? Isn't what then must be considered the scope and nature of the offences? The not the real likelihood. Is there any doubt? Forget about owners. Because they. Is there any doubt, despite the fact that they've cleared that onus in the traditional sense, that I might make a mistake here? What effect would have that have on the public? But, uh, if, if that happens, now suddenly we're sitting without two of our accused persons. They're mining that little mine in Angola that they've been working on for so long before the bomb strike. that question. <clears throat> you know I'm an academic. And before you answer a question as hefty and difficult as that, I think we have to understand the conceptual aspect of it. What is this public interest? So that when we say this is in the public interest or not in the public interest, we should be knowing what we are talking about. Speaking for myself, I don't know. What is it? Stand there and let me interrogate my brother's question because it will be very interesting. Thank you. Deal with this because it's a very important question that has been asked. Uh, but in order, in order to do that, I need to look at, pull out one of my earlier notes because I want to, I want it to directly in respond to, to his logic question. I'm wondering whether I'll be taking too much liberties if I can ask for the gentleman of five minutes. Well, let's start with another one before we take a break. And that is, it even says, I can look at, we can look at the public interest, despite the fact, not only the public interest, the administration of justice, or even if you prove those three factors. Now, let me ask you this way. What? The same question. Is it in the administration of interest of the administration of justice, looking at the magnitude of the offences committed, the nature of those offences, to even risk, to in any manner risk, the disappearance of one or more of the accused in the course of the trial, if they granted bail. You never know, Mr. Stephenson might turn up and be a wonderful witness, and then suddenly there's like, oops, you know, no, no. That mine in Angola is now a luxury. It's, it's a nice place to be now. Um, I, I'm getting the feeling that I have now crossed the traditional hurdles. And now I'm truly within. Assuming you've not, you don't have to get that feeling that you might be totally in the wrong feeling. <laughs> I don't want to put it that way. I'm assuming for the moment, because you say we must set the judgment aside, we must now consider it ourselves. And you submitted to us that on your version and your client's version, which you say we can accept, they've, they've passed muster on the traditional criteria. But then there's a next bar, which is section 61. And it's got two legs. It's got the interest of justice legs and the public interest legs, which my little brother so put to you. 
so I just want to deal with the public interest leg first because that is what Judge Mutelli also dealt with. He didn't go to the public interest leg. He said in the interest of administration of justice, he didn't go to the public interest leg. So what is the step up? What is the criteria for that step up? To say despite the fact that you've established this, I still can't give you bail because I sim we simply cannot, in a case like this, risk, take a risk, even if it's a very small risk. That these people don't stand. It's in the public interest. First of all, let me start with the administration of justice. I wanted a break, but it doesn't appear like I'm getting the vote. Um, it, it seems like, and I will start first with the administration of justice. It is in the administration of justice, the interest of the administration of justice, that. People in similar circumstances, as much as possible, be treated similar, equally. It is also in the interest of the administration of justice that the pronouncements of our courts over many years, starting with, let's say, Acheson from 1991, on what are the considerations of being, be applied in a standardized fashion. Because anything beyond that creates a situation of other people being treated less favorably. Because we believe we are piecing this undivined notion of public interest or administration of justice. And it is in the public interest that there is certainty in our law. Because what is our law? Our law is simply to say that we have a social contract amongst ourselves as the society of the people. That if you are being interfaced with the criminal justice system, you will be treated according to these precepts. Needless to point out that what would really be undermining to the justice system is that people that are accused of crimes are not prosecuted. Yes. But since you are wondering, considering also that each case might be considered in its own merits. Yes. I also agree that this case, see that one is on the uh, justice somewhere. But the important aspect is that while section, certain factual circumstances may create a necessity for differences, the first and the pillars that justify our constitution, the act as well as the jurisprudence, must as possible, as far as possible, be maintained. Otherwise, we, the, the alternative is that. We create a situation where there is no certainty of the law. The rule of law then gets threatened when nobody knows what the law is and how each person will be treated under similar circumstances. If no discretion is in our law. Yes. And, and moreover, uh, Justices, if I move to the, to the second pillar of my argument then, the administration of justice is nothing more than just to make sure that the people that are asked will in fact stand their trial. It's more, nothing more than that they would not interfere. And that's why we have all these safeguards that are listed in the Atchison to say when a person applies for bail, these are the, the, the parameters that will, as much as possible, try to take in order to judge whether that person is a suitable candidate for bail or not. And that's why we submit that in the instance of this case, and looking purposely at the, our constitution, but also looking at the the simple criteria laid out in Atchison, the risk, the risk that is said, the problem, it must be probable. The likelihood is not a requirement. It must be probable, something that is based on evidence of appellant four, five, and six. Probable is earnest, is that what Yes, but And when we look at the facts, they don't justify the conclusion that it will not be in the interest of the administration of justice for these people to be released on bail. Public interest, on the other hand, and I'm happy because even at the Gustavo Meta, the learned justices, they accept that it's a very difficult concept to define. It's mainly notional, the aspect of public interest. Uh, because what does it mean? Does it mean making sure that the public is celebrating? That, does it mean, what does it mean? Make it easy, does it 
thought we actually say that the public interest is at play in this case. Yes, sir. What I understood from that judgment is that public interest is to make sure that the justice system functions and functions well. And, and at the end, even public interest, when you're subjected to scrutiny, you only end up one vote, and that is the administration of justice. The public is interested that, I don't think that it's in the public, and this is my submission. My submission is that it's not in the public interest that simply because a person is charged with corruption, they should be out of the post. Grave injustice is okay if that overzealous criteria is adopted. But where a person has come before the court and say, there is no reason to keep me in detention. How do I deal with 608,000 volumes of the record from the detention center? That's a different thing. Yes. You, you, you're not going back. Yes. yes, so the point that I'm making at the end is that where they have demonstrated that the means and the achievement of justice will not be undermined, I don't see why that is not in the interest of justice that we have a facility for bail. Let them be admitted and let them be prosecuted as soon as possible. The witnesses are there. Even if one of them absconds, the prosecution will still go ahead because the witnesses are there. So the notion that maybe if one absconds, it has not been demonstrated. And of course, I'm arguing out of you know my notional thinking here. What impact will it have if one absconds on, on the other end and so on? Because the testimony is there, the witnesses implicating each of them is there. You speak to witnesses. You speak to witnesses to forget something. <laughs> that, that becomes too far fetched. Uh, uh, just that well, when is it too far fetched? When is it the likelihood that you must that cover? When, when the court says there is a risk. It stops there. That becomes too far fetched because even in the risk assessment, you, you have risk that is, yeah, there is a risk that lightning can strike all of us here, but what is the probability that the lightning will be happening? You know, what type of risk is it? You know, so. I'm asking you, when does the interest of justice require that bail be refused despite the fact that they don't establish the other three? You will recall in the duplicis matter there were 13 accused. 13, one, three accused. Um, the other 11 were actually given bail. But the court looked at the past conduct of these two. The moment they had and Mr. Duplessis and another, the moment they heard that the police were looking for them, they absconded to South Africa. They ran away. The first round of the refusal. Not only did they run away, they crossed the border, but they crossed at an unauthorized border crossing point. They did not go through the proper borders. They hid their passports. They did everything to undermine the ends of justice to reach them. Why did they come back to Namibia? It was not voluntary. Of course, we know it was purportedly voluntary, but from the judgment of the court, they were actually faced with the possible arrest as well in South Africa for entering the country illegal and being treated under severe laws there of immigration. On that basis, they were faced with two evils, and then they came back to Namibia. So the court could use the past to say, your past behavior justified this to conclude, and those were weighted crowds that were considered by the court. And to say that because a person is likely to talk to the witness, it means that in Namibia, what it would denote, and I'm, I'm, I'm just as frank, I'm not saying this is a conclusion, but I'm just saying that the dichotomy of this is that if a family member is arrested, he would never be released on bail because he would be in constant contact with other family members. If a family member is arrested, on domestic violence, for example. So the balancing act, this is where the balancing act, there is always maybe a risk. But if there is a risk, the consequences are equally as severe. Because these witnesses that we have seen, no witness has said in their witness statement, I'm giving you this witness statement, but I'm afraid of accused number one, two, three, or number four, number five, number six. They have not said to them, they are likely to be influenced on procedurally or incorrectly, and then they can change their measure. 
in the manner in which we are found, I would understand if, for example, the, the, the people have just been arrested, the, the investigations, the witnesses have all not been accounted for. In this instance, all those fears that one would have traditionally have been accounted for and ameliorated by the fact that investigations are complete. The witnesses gave statements while these people were still out. None of the witnesses has complained that he was pointed out with a gun or threatened to change their version or whatsoever. In fact, one witness that was communicated with was so transparent that he also said that to the court that I was contacted by XYZ subsequently. So the consequences of interference with the witnesses is a clear reality to this, this appellate. That it will add to a plethora of the charges that they are facing. As a result of which I say, there is always this fear, but the fear must also be reasonable in the circumstances of the case as well as the circumstances of the effects that are being implemented. And I don't see that, uh, I don't see that in this instance, there should be a fear. Of course, there is bail conditions as well that can be which are, you know, the court can determine the, the, the appropriate bail condition. I'm saying this even in the past, prior to the independence or the constitutionalism of Namibia as well as South Africa. Well, when we knew that the regimes that were running uh, those countries at that time were some of the most, you know, uh, obscure in terms of human rights. They were, they, were, they were bad regimes. Even then, what people were just sometimes they put them under house arrest. You know, there are so many tools that are within the box of the court to make sure that some of these uh, fears are being made properly, uh, 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 how would I say, either nullified or seriously reduced. And therefore to say that there is a fear as a result of which, um, uh, uh, you know, lock you up for a fair that we don't know how many years while the trial is going ahead. That would, that would, it would be, you know, throwing, equivalent to the proverbial throwing the, the baby out of the water, which we submit that there is a proper basis for this court to interfere, and we persuade the court and we are cheerleading that the court must not hesitate to also uphold the rights of these appellants. Um, we have submitted that the court can actually uh, grant bail, but alternatively we say the court can grant bail and refer the matter back to the court of for appropriate bail conditions, if the court is with us on the, the application. Um, unless you know, those are our suspicions about Insofar as public interest, we, we, we submit that insofar as, you know, that notion is concerned, albeit very difficult, the, the public is interested to make sure that people that are accused of crimes, not serious crimes only, all crimes, are properly dealt with according to the law, they are prosecuted, and if they are found guilty, they are convicted. You know, that the administration of justice is, 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 is properly functioning. I don't, and I have never come across any authority or even an academic exercise to the, to the notion that uh, public interest includes the enjoyment of pre-sentencing punishment, just for the fun of it. Um, I have never heard that, um, and I have never read anywhere I'm a student of, um, of law, I have I'm reading a bit. Maybe I'll see one of them, but till now, I've never seen the public interest being associated with pre-sentencing punishment in order to gratify uh, uh, the, the interest of the public. In fact, the interest of the public, as we look at it, as it's normally commonly understood, uh, the courts should be worried because this is a court of law. That the public interest me pre-sentence punishment. That, I mean, that you can read from Muhammad's judgment and from even from Butelli's judgment, his first paragraph said that's never the intention. And public interest must be, as I have said, the upliftment and the support of the administration of justice. It cannot go beyond that because I don't see on what basis you predicated on which grounds in terms of the Constitution. Right, that um, what you are saying in effect that you are giving us an assignment to go and determine what public interest is. And once we have done so, we must apply it to the facts of it. No, but not is that not the easiest way to answer? That, that, that would be correct. If you look at the judgment of um, the shadow portal, 
which all of us have uh, referred to in our heads. This is what Justice Olin and Justice Hannah said in page 43 of that judgment. Uh, Charlotte Botter, Charlotte Helena Botter versus the state. It's, a, it's, it's, it's one of the Lofas Clausicos in Namibia for, for the bail, consideration of a bail application. It dealt with that issue of uh, public interest, uh, where it was argued that the bail should be refused in the interest of the public or the interest of the administration of justice. And this is what Justice Olin and Justice Hannah said. I spelled out here in as far as possible the ambit of the concepts in the interest of the public and the administration of justice and provided some examples. However, one example of what it is not is the magistrate's second magistrate's suggestion in the second application when he was confronted by the applicant with the perceived inequality and injustice between the application of his concepts in a case compared with others. The magistrate suggested that the measure of publicity of a case, that the case has attracted wide publicity, uh, has or distinguishes the public interest in one's case from that of others. If that is what he meant, then I have no hesitation to say that the amount of publicity in itself can never be a crowd for finding that the crown being obeyed will not be in the interest of the public and the administration of justice. In fact, Justice Pauline said, the so-called public outcry, we had this as well in this instance, there was this public outcry. He says, the so-called public outcry as relied on by the prosecutor in the state versus love was misconceived. The court has already dealt with some qualifications of this consideration in S versus Duplessis. In this judgment, there is further delineation, but the guidelines laid down and the examples given are not intended to be exhaustive. So we say, even if the court considers public interest, the court shall, and we submit, should divorce his thinking from the usual lazy submission that there was public outcry, or the public is vying, there is social media activity on the interest, and therefore, the public will not be very pleased um, with, 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 with this qualification. There is one book that I read when I was very young and in high school of a trial that took place about 2022 20, years ago in one country in the Middle East. Uh, of a gentleman that was 23 years old, uh, where there was a huge outcry of the public uh, crucify him, crucify him and he was crucified to satisfy the public interest. Um, we say those notions that there are a lot of people cheerleading and saying that people must be treated harshly and unfairly and so on, those are not considerations that should be in the interest of the public. Therefore, we say injustice, wherever it is, must be rejected by this court, whether it's packaged as you know, a modern day uh, lateral thinking of you know, hating corruption or whatever. We all do not like corruption. We all want people that are corrupt to be prosecuted. But there is a bail system that accounts for that. We have Namibia's finest police system that is capable of policing all this. There was never any evidence that the Namibian national police is so incompetent that they cannot do their way. In fact, there was no evidence that was placed. I'm talking about proper evidence that if a passport is removed, you know, from these people, the conditions are put properly they will not be able to be subjected to proper monitoring. So we submit that your lordships, for whatever reason, people that would want to run away, they would have run away in the past. Appellant four, five, and six, they were aware of the charges that they were facing long before they were arrested. They did not run away, they did not. Yes, it pleases you, Lord. Those are my submissions. Yes, so there are appropriate remedies that, are, that can, and I have already dealt with that. I don't know, my lord, if I can say more. I said today I'm only dealing with the law of the facts. Those are the facts I submit that they are clear. Or the judgment is to be upset. And my flight said yes, it is. Okay, the court will adjourn for lunch now and we'll reconvene at two o'clock. Court will adjourn.
Is that the argument? Uh, Your Lordship, unfortunately, for purpose of these proceedings, as we've already alluded to in the eyes of arguments that they had the owners, they did not produce the record of proceedings indicating the remands in this particular case from the first appearance until the day the bail application was held to see what had occurred in this particular case. We had an application before. I argued that application regarding the release of the applicants in terms of Article 12. That was a separate application that was dealt with before. But unfortunately, I did not want to deal with that because it's not part of these proceedings, but there was such an application, Your Lordship. Thank you. May as it please the court. If you don't mind, just raise your voice a little bit. Uh, as it please the court, Your Lordship, I'll try to speak louder. Oh, okay. <laughs> I will yeah. speak louder, Your Lordship. No, no. Oh, yes, it's, <laughs> it's a much louder voice than mine. <laughs> um, Your Lordship, the purpose of this appeal, the main reason as to why we are here today, is to ascertain whether or not the judge in the High Court was wrong in his decision refusing bail to the applicants. That is the main reason that we are here today. Um, I know there have been numerous issues that have been raised in the notices of appeal for the first three applicants and for the last three applicants in this particular matter and in the heads of arguments. Um, We've dealt with those sufficiently. Um, I do not intend to regurgitate each and every point, except those, some of them which have been touched, where we need to rectify. I'm starting to hear you. Uh, I'm struggling. Okay. I don't know whether... Uh, your Lordship, you maybe... Mumble to yourselves. <laughs> you must talk to us. All right. Um, your Lordship, mm -hmm. what I'm saying is that in respect of this particular case, there are numerous grounds of appeal that have been raised by all six applicants. And there are several issues that have been dealt with in their heads of arguments. We've covered all those issues in our heads of arguments. I do not intend to regurgitate each and every issue, except those which need clarification, um, which were raised now during arguments where I need to clarify. So, and so far as this case is concerned, your lordships, we know there's also the issue of the two judgments. I'll come to that later on. But irrespective of whether or not this particular court relies on the transcribed judgment or on the signed judgment, the question still remains the same. Was the court wrong in denying the appellant's bail? That is the question that the court has to answer, irrespective of which judgment the court has to rely on. Now, I just want to highlight to this particular court that, insofar as this case is concerned, I respectfully submit that the court was not wrong in its decision refusing bail to the applicants, appellants in this matter. Um, insofar as this case is concerned, the reasons for denying bail are on record. And what the court found is that it's not going to be in the interest of the administration of justice for the appellants in this matter to be released on bail. And the court found further that there is a likelihood of the appellants interfering with the case or the evidence or witnesses insofar as this case is concerned. That was the basis on which bail was denied. Now, this court has to ascertain, was the court wrong or right? in reaching such a conclusion. And the court has to do that in the context of the evidence that has already been laid in the High Court. Um, the test on appeal, Your Lordship, I've already referred to the matter of Elias Angome versus the state in paragraph 49 of the state sets of arguments, where the court in instance indicated that the test under section 65.4 the question is whether the decision to refuse bail was wrong or not. And the court went further to say that even if there are material misdirections contained in the reaching of that conclusion has occurred in this case in the Hangome matter, this court is still required to consider the question as to whether the decision itself was wrong or whether bail should have been refused or not. That is what the court has to consider. Now, looking at the evidence that was placed before the High Court, your Lordships. I'll just briefly summarize 
to illustrate to this court that the court was in nature of fact right in its conclusion in denying bail to the, to the appellants. We know in respect of the second appellant that he has a pending case of obstructing the course of justice and charges of bribery that is pending against him. And we know the allegations against him in that particular matter is that he sent an agent to bribe officials of the ACC with 250,000 Namibian dollars in order for them to release exhibits which were in their custody to him. These are exhibits which have been seized in terms of the law. He wanted them to be released to him. There is that evidence which are, is available before court. So we are not really only dealing with the likelihood when you look at this particular appellant. When we look at this, there is actual evidence of interference, which is there that the court has to take into consideration in deciding whether or not to release the appellant on bail. And this is what the court had to consider, whether or not there's a likelihood of interference with um, investigations or witnesses or with the case itself. Because in this case, we are dealing with exhibits which are already in the custody of the accused person, not necessarily potential witnesses in the custody of the ACC, not potential um, witnesses and so on. Um, evidence was also led with regard to information that was found on the accused person's um, cell phone where he was hatching plans to manufacture documents with regard to delivery of fish in Angola. We, and this was done prior to him being arrested. After his arrest, that is when he tried to bribe the members of the ACC. So at least we have a glimpse of what he's likely to do if he's released on bail. Because when he's a free man, he has more resources to try to interfere with this matter and manufacture documents if need be. And that would be very prejudicial to the administration of justice when false documents are being presented before the court. I also just want to highlight that insofar as this particular appellant is concerned, there's evidence that was laid to Mr. I'm James Atubilipi. Evidence was also further laid that on two separate occasions, not once, but twice, in 2010 and in 2000 and, not 10, <laughs> your lordship, uh, in 2020, and 2021, evidence was laid that on two separate occasions, while in the custody of the correctional facility, was found in possession of cell phones, which is not allowed in the correctional facility. So this person, very well aware of the rules and regulations, the laws governing the correctional facility, on the first occasion is found with a cell phone. Fine. Does he respect the rules and laws which govern the correctional facility? He does not. He's still found with a cell phone on a second occasion about a year later. So in instance, what that illustrates is that this person has no respect for the law. So even if this court was to consider imposing bail conditions, what guarantee is there that is going to uh, adhere to those conditions? Because he has shown, and that evidence is there, that he's not going to obey rules, regulations, laws. So really, the court will be at the mercy of this person and it will just be a matter of praying that he does not interfere because the evidence itself shows that he will not, he's likely to interfere and he's likely not to follow um, any bail conditions that may be imposed by this honorable court. Do we have any, anything on record to show that while he was in possession of a cell phone, he attempted to contact a particular witness with it, yeah. or whether there was any communication or whatever. It might be he violated the prison regulations, which may have been unfortunate, but did he use that phone to contact another person, a witness, or would be witness in this case? Is there anything to that effect. It's concerned um, from the evidence that was laid. No, that is not the case. Um, from my recollection is that the contact was between the first appellant and the second appellant. So there was no evidence that he attempted to um, contact witnesses. What I want to highlight 
this evidence was not led to show that there's a likelihood of interference. It was led to show that even if the court imposes bail conditions, he's likely not to adhere to those conditions because of his conduct at the facility or lordship. The issues of interference, that evidence has been laid with regard to the charges that he faces of obstructing the course of justice and bribery of the SEC officials, persons who are investigating his case. So the issue of interference has already been sorted out with the pending case. Now, this evidence shows that he's not likely to adhere with bail conditions, uh, your lordship. That was primarily the reason why this, this evidence was laid. And I just want to highlight your lordship that in so far as his phone is concerned, we heard from the evidence that was laid, which is on record, that there was nothing on his phone. The information was deleted. So unfortunately, it cannot be said whether or not he tried to interfere or what he was using that phone for. It's unknown. So if he can, he's so cunning to keep such information away from the prison authorities. What more if he's released on bail? Because if we cannot find that while he's in custody, really, we will not find anything wrong and we will never know that interfered if he's released um, on bail. I also just want to highlight, Your Lordship, that insofar as the first appellant is concerned, equally, he faces charges of obstructing or defeating the cause of justice. Similar to the, first, to the second appellant, these charges arose while he was in custody. So this goes to illustrate that no matter where they are, the likelihood of interference is high. But if they are released on bail, Really, there's nothing that anyone can do to stop them from interfering in this matter. And the charges that he faces in respect of this particular case, he had also sent an agent to remove documents from his premises, which were relevant to the determination of this matter. So there is evidence of a likelihood of this particular appellant as well, interfering with this matter, either with the evidence with the witnesses, that likelihood is there based on the charges that he faces. Now, we also led evidence that he too was found with a cell phone in the correctional facility. This is a former minister of, yes, appellant one, your lordship, that he too was found with the cell phone in the correctional facility where he's held. Fortunately for the state and unfortunately for him, there was information which was found on that cell phone. And the information revealed that he was conducting research with regard to extradition. And not just any extradition, and not extradition from any other country, but in particular extradition from Dubai, the UAE. That is the research that was being conducted by the first appellant. We know there's evidence before court, and this evidence has never been disputed. The appellant chose not to testify, so this evidence remains undisputed. That 75% of the usage fee in terms of the agreement that one of the accused persons, Mr. Gustavo, signed, which is not, uh, who is not before court, was to be paid to a company to Davala, Dubai. From the proof of payments that were submitted before court, and from the evidence of the investigating officer, it was testified that at least an amount of $4.1 million was paid to, a, to an entity, to Ndavala, where the second appellant has an interest in, in Dubai. Now, the whereabouts of those funds, they are known at this stage. They have not been recovered. So really, at the end of the day, we have this person who's a lawyer by profession, was a former attorney general, a former minister, he knows the law, he knows extradition. There's no doubt he worked in the Ministry of Justice. So issues of extradition, he knows what that is. And he knows we do not have an extradition agreement with Dubai. So when we have regard to his conduct and his gestures on the phone, 
First and foremost, I'll deal with the issue of absconding later, but it shows that there's an intention of this person to abscond because there are funds, there are possibly funds in Dubai um, in the benefit of the syndicate. Secondly, what this shows is that there's a likelihood of him also interfering with the recovery of those funds. If he goes to Dubai and does whatever he wants with those funds, well, that's the end of the matter. I respectfully submit your lordship that on that basis, the High Court did not err in its decision in finding that there is that likelihood of interference and um, it's not in the interest of the Administration of Justice to release the appellant on bail. I just want to also highlight that in respect of the fourth appellant, um, much was said in arguments that the version by the state regarding interference with Mr. Kamano was never put to him. Your Lordship, that version was put to him, and Mr. Kamano's statement was read to the fourth appellant with regard to the issue of interference in relation to the consultancy agreement. Um, your Lordship, um, your Lordship, so I'm not going to regurgitate everything that was said regarding the interference, but that can be found from page 902 of the record, volume 8, and it goes all the way to 907 of the record. That is where that version was put. I just want to clarify that that version of interference with regard... I thought you were actually going to show us where it is said that they did the sort of things that you are referring to. Because we were given the impression that statements, empty statements are being made against this uh, poor appellants and uh, <laughs> three, four, and f uh -uh. four, five, and six. Yeah. And um, I thought you were going to say, uh uh, this is not correct. Look at what you have here. Volume yeah. As it plays the court, your lordship, I can do that. Um, then, if the court will just bear with me, because I'll need to get the page numbers where that was said. I want to start off with the statement of Mr. Kamano. Oh, 5 and 1216, that's what Mr. Uh, yeah. Yes, Your Lordship. I just want to. My notes are correct. The judgment. Oh, was that the judgment? No, no. Statement of command. Yes, your lordship, it starts from page 1201 of that. Uh, it's volume, volume 11, your lordship. I think this is exhibit Z23, volume 11. Just give me the page number again. Um, the paragraph is paragraph 40. Mm -hmm. at at page? 1,201, Your Lordship. 1,201. On the exhibits? Yes, Your Lordship, on the exhibits, on, on the exhibits files. Yeah. I'm referring to the statement as contained in the, in the file itself, Your Lordship. Um, what is indicated at paragraph 40, the, the title is Consultancy Service Agreement between Skeleton Cost Rolling PTY and Guanyama Investment Trust. This is from the statement of the state witness, Mr. Kamano. Uh, 
And he stipulates that during about November 2019, Mr. Ngipunya called me about a consultancy service agreement. He wanted Novanam to sign for consulting services he rendered to us. A copy of the agreement is attached here to marked as JR 153JR160. And then it goes on at the next page. At paragraph 41, that Mr. Nipunya told me that the agreement would offer him and Novanam a form of safety. At 42, it says Mr. Nipunya sent a draft agreement to me by email. I can re recall the exact date when I received it. I told him that I would forward the agreement to Novanam CEO, Mr. Miguel Todesilas. Says I did not have the authority to sign the agreement. And it goes on at the bottom where he refers to contact with Mr. Ngipunya after his arrest. Um, I'll just start from paragraph 47, Your Lordship, I think just to put everything into perspective. Is that... Are you going to read to us? Excuse me, Your Lordship. Sorry, you say you're moving on to 47. Yes, that Your Lordship. our background. 47, okay, good. Yes, Your Lordship. Um, where did I stop at 42? Yes, 43. Just to continue at 43, my apologies. Uh, Mr. Ngipunya contacted me a few weeks after our first discussion to follow up on Novanam's signature of the Consultancy Services Agreement. I informed him that Mr. Todesilas was in Spain, but I would follow up on his signature once he was back in Namibia. And 44, it goes on to say that Mr. Todesilas decided not to sign the service agreement and it was never signed. 45, he says that Guanyemba did not render to Novanam the services he described in paragraphs 3 to 6 of the agreement during the period 2017 to 2019, and these functions um, Novanam performs and manages itself. Um, moving on to paragraph 47, he goes on to say that it came to my knowledge that Mr. Ngipunya was arrested during February 2020 and has remained in detention since then. He has contacted me on my mobile phone on at least two occasions from prison from an undisclosed number displaying no number on my mobile screen. I recall some of our discussions have centered around the following topics. Mr. Ngipunya called me to request signature of the service agreement between Skeleton Cost Rolling, Guanyeme Investment Trust, has referred to before. And then he goes on. Your Lordship, I think I'll just read everything that's contained on the next page because this also relates to one of the other applicants, um, appellants. Uh, I'll still have to deal with him subsequently. So I'll just indicate what is indicated in his statement so I do not have to come back to it, Your Lordships. Um, in paragraph 42, it is indicated that Mr. Ngipunya also contacted me for financial assistance. He requested that an amount of 500000 to be paid to his lawyer, Mr. Milton Engelbrecht. I informed him that I could not afford to assist him with such a large sum of money. He asked me if I can give him 80,000. I said I cannot afford such an amount of money, but would assist him with a smaller amount. I received Mr. Engelbrecht's banking details through a WhatsApp message, as far as I can recall, from a person who I knew as Oti, who told me he is one of Mr. Ngipunya's friends. I instructed my gardener to make a cash deposit in Mr. Engelbrecht's account of an amount in the range of 30000 to 50000 I cannot recall the exact amount. I did not keep a deposit slip. The money was paid. The money I paid was my own funds kept at home. And then it goes on in paragraph 50 to state that I received other telephone calls from Oti again. And from the evidence before court, what was disclosed by Mr. Engelbrecht is that Oti is the fifth appellant in this matter, Mr. Otniel Shudifonia. That I received other telephone calls from Oti again, asking when he can meet up with me. He also sent me text messages asking when I would be in Winduk again. These messages were sent on 21 and 27 November 2020. He used the number, and the number is indicated there, to communicate with me which number I saved as a contact named Oti, Mike's friend, attached here to the screenshot of our text messages marked JR166. Your Lordships, 
I just want to highlight one thing because much has been said about a misdirection by the court that with reference to the witness saying that it was backdated. Um, the consultancy services agreement was submitted as an exhibit before court. And what I noticed from the exhibit bundle, it should be marked as exhibit Z22. But unfortunately, I don't know if it's only my file that does not reflect it. The agreement is not on my file, um, on the exhibit file, but it was submitted in court and uh, this is not in dispute. It was submitted with a statement of this witness as Z22. On the list agreement appears they should be on top of this witness statements, um, but it's not there. Um, you, your lordships, I hope it's not an issue. I just want to illustrate something with regard to the back dating. I hope it's not an issue. I have a copy of the agreement with me. I just want to provide that to the court as well. To the, to the statement of Mr. Ramon. Isn't it attached to the statement of Mr. Ramon? Is it attached there as well? I, let uh, me just... That's what Mr. Tabang said. It should have he been said attached. said an annexure to that agreement. Yes, Your Lordship, it was an annexure. Um, I just want to highlight... Um, Your Lordship, it appears it's not attached, but it was submitted as, as an exhibit in the High Court. I'm informed by my colleagues who prepared the record that it is not attached. Of course, I had the impression Mr. Tavang said that maybe he refers to it as attached, and what you've also already said is attached here to it. It is attached. It was <laughs> attached, but it was marked as a separate exhibit, as Z22 in court. Is that what you want to hand in? Yes, Your Lordship. I just wanted to illustrate a point with regard to the back dating. Well, what do you say, Mr. Tavang? If it was a, if it was handed, it was used in the High Court, it was an exhibit, but you can't really object if it's handed in, can you? <laughs> Unless you have it somewhere. I want to be clear on one thing. Um, it was not, in fact, the, the attachments to this, the alleged attachments to this that are referred to in this statement, they were not put together as next chance to this statement in the High Court. But it, was, it was submitted on its own, and where there were other agreements that were dealt with, they will, they will be brought in successfully on their own, but not as an exchange. Yes, yeah, can you object? If they were handed these in as, as an exhibit, surely then they must be before us too. It's <laughs> a lot of people are because in the high court, I only really said that one, one, one of the, the appellants, appellant number four. Um, there was a time when I was not there in the proceedings. But I'm, I'm, my instructions are that even the JR not is that the alleged, they were never attached as part of the situation that I call. Oh, sorry, let me hear what Mr. Little Bay has got to say. Your Lordship, at the list of exhibits, the first file, bundle of exhibits, exhibit, this is volume one, where the list of exhibits is indicated. Yes, Your Lordship. Yes. Okay, it's not numbered, but it's number 183 on the far left side. Yeah. Just on top of Mr. Jose Ramon's statement, there's an indication there exhibits Z22 agreement, no page number. That agreement is not there. That agreement, Your Lordship. That you've got there that you want to hand up. It's the same agreement that I have here, Your Lordship. No. It was submitted as an exhibit, but I don't know for whatever reason, he has not be it does not form part okay, of the well, bundle of exhibits. Maybe you can um, uh, yeah, well then I can't see how they can object to it being handed in, but uh, it's supposed to be there and it was an omission. Speaking for myself, uh, we are you see it was on the record as a separate exhibit we don't have a problem but the analogy that i was trying to clarify is that to say that it was put together as an exception to that statement together with all the costs that was never the case the statement was submitted as, as an individual uh, yes but it is part of the record and it was submitted later we don't have any 
Yes, but, That's what we hear. yes, but to, to, to allege that it was subsequently maybe exercised from the bank of like an affidavit in financial. That was, it doesn't matter what it didn't. Yes. It's in the index and it's supposed to be part of the record, aren't they? Yes, there we can do it in the yeah. If I may just uh, have a few copies, I've given a one to my colleague. Um, it appears I can only find two copies, I don't know. But it's fine, I'll just give my copy to the court as well. Six. You should be able to say whether you object that he hands up the documents that he has which could have been part of the record, although not attached to the exhibit. You should be in a position to say, I object or I do not object. Well, remember, um, we are sitting here as a court of appeal, and uh, our competence is circumscribed within the four corners of the record. So this explains why it is necessary for uh, parties to agree that this matter was presented in the court below or it was not presented. Because if it was not presented, it cannot be brought before us because we'll be called upon now to judge what happened in the court of court using documents that were not before the court. And that is unacceptable. So once you accept that, yes, it was submitted as an exhibit, but it does not appear as part of the bundle before the court now, then it says it can be handed in. misdirection by the court in finding that the agreement was uh, backdated. I just want to illustrate that in cross-examination, I've referred to the pages earlier on where this took place. He was asked if this is the agreement that was forwarded to the witness. That is the fourth applicant. And he confirmed that this is the agreement. And this was done in 2019 
when I was asked if this is the one that you forwarded, and they agreed. And from the agreement that is forwarded, which was also attached to the witness statement, the date on which it was supposedly, it was supposed to be signed, at the last page is 2017. So really, if the court found that there was a backdating, that this agreement was to be backdated, that is not a material misdirection, because from the evidence that is apparent before court, in actual fact, the agreement was to be backdated because the date which appears on the agreement is not the actual date of signature. It was not going to be the actual date of signature. It was going to be a date before that. See, the agreement was not signed in 2017. Yes, Your Lordship. And then the request was it should be signed as if it, would, it was signed in 2017. Yes, Your Lordship. That's where the backdated comes from. It's not a question of he was told to backdate it. Yes. If he signed it, it would have appeared that it was signed in 2017. Is that what you are saying? Yes, Your Lordship. That is what the state is saying. Mm -hmm. And that is what appears from the document itself. Mm -hmm. Because this was provided to the witness in 2019 mm -hmm. with a date of 2017. So had it been signed, it would have been instance been backdated to 2017. Um, I think that's just one aspect I wanted to highlight that there is in instance no material misdirection by the court on that aspect. Um, I also just want to indicate, it has already been alluded to that while he was in custody, even prior to being in custody, he knew that investigations were taking place regarding this matter. This matter was a highly publicized matter. He knew investigations were taking place. Now, in all his dealings with all the witnesses, before even the Anti-Corruption Commission could approach any witnesses, he knew who those potential witnesses were, because he knew which unlawful activities were taking place prior to his incarceration. And he knew that Mr. Kamano would be a potential witness because he knew that the activities that took place with this person were unlawful. And he approached this witness in order to influence the witness to sign an agreement, which is dated 2017, as if the such services have been rendered since 2017. Uh, Certainly the case says there, your lordships, which deal with interference of potential witnesses, uh, refer to the matter of state versus, of Chizu versus the state. Uh, my apologies, Your Lordship. Reverting to your normal habit, which is maybe fine in the smaller courts, but here you must speak up a bit. Uh, perhaps, Your Lordship, the court is too big. <laughs> I'm too far. We're too far away. We can't talk. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to speak louder instead of shouting. I feel as if I'm shouting when I speak louder. In. I don't want to be disrespectful to the court. Um, your Lordships, have. We refer to the matter of Chizo versus the state in paragraph 55 of the state sense of arguments. Where the court, when considering the likelihood that an accused will interfere with witnesses, the court pointed out that, as mentioned, the court did consider the position of the appellant and came to the conclusion that he was well positioned and would likely exert influence over potential witnesses and suspects. And I've also referred to the matter of Matali versus the state, which is more relevant insofar as this particular case is concerned, where the court in paragraph five stated that the state laid evidence that the appellant found potential witnesses whilst in custody, the same allegation says this particular matter, in connection with medication he wanted brought to the police station and bring the appellant was found with two SIM cards and two cell phones whilst he was in the holding cells. Something also is quite similar to the other appellants in this matter. Now, in considering whether there was a real likelihood of interference with witnesses in this particular case, the court found in paragraph 13 that in this matter, the accused is a friend to two potential state witnesses, namely Sambi and Victor, and he already tried to contact them whilst he was in custody with a cell phone that he was not supposed to keep in custody. So similarly, Your Lordship, I just want to highlight that at that stage, when he was consulting these witnesses, 
when he was not in custody. He knew there were potential witnesses. So this also illustrates that there is a likelihood of him interfering with witnesses. Your Lordships, I also just want to highlight in so far as this case is concerned, um, from the evidence that has been laid in the Matrix Court, um, we had evidence that he normally takes instructions from the second appellant and Mr. Isau, and he followed those instructions. That was, uh, I'm told my voice is low again. <clears throat> yes, um, from the evidence in the Matrix Court, we had, and he also confirmed again in his evidence at the High Court that he would take instructions from Mr. Isau and from the second appellant, and he could not refuse such instructions. We know from the evidence that has been laid that these instructions were unlawful. I know it has been argued that he has a defense to the charges with regard to Fishco, which was the issue in the Matrix Court, the 75.6 million that was paid to the law firm DHC at the time, that he has a good defense to this. I mean, his defense is that he was working on instructions. That has been his defense all along, the same defense that he brought in, in the High Court. But we know this was unlawful because funds for a private entity, for a party, a political party, that can never be in public interest. So him already transferring those funds to DHC well knowing that these are for a political party or for the campaign, that was unlawful on its own. And as the CEO of Fishco, he knew what governmental objectives are and that these are in public interest. Yes. Might have been unlawful, but not, not necessarily criminals. What would have been the position if it, all that money had been passed on to the intended beneficiary? And he didn't benefit at all personally from it. That surely, that may have been unlawful to use to use that mechanism. But was he is he then criminally liable for it? Your Lordship, when it comes to intention, I think that is what the court is going to. Um, on the issues of intention, even dollars eventualis would surface in the transfer of those funds. So we also have to look at the issue of recklessness, whether he believed that these funds were for governmental objectives. The problem that not even 10% of those funds ended up with the intended beneficiary. And the money trail and shows it ended up in, doc, in entities belonging to entities in which the accused have interest in. Yes, that is the problem, including Jaco, where the state alleges he had a secret interest in. It also received funds. And you know those entities were buying assets on behalf of the the appellant. So at the end of the day, Your Lordship, insofar as the state's case is concerned, it is a strong case. Um, it's already been highlighted in the heads of arguments that the allocation letters from the Minister of Fisheries would indicate the governmental objectives. The part will not be there. He'd signed agreement with the Samheji group of companies indicating that the quotas are allocated to uh, Fishco and the funds should be paid to Fishco. So he knew where the funds should be. So, and he diverted those funds. I mean, insofar as the case is concerned, there is a prima facie case there. Um, we've dealt with that sufficiently in the haste of arguments. I'm not going to regurgitate that. I just want to deal with the main issues before this court, your lordship. And we know from what I've highlighted now, that apart from taking instructions from, as he claims, from his co-accused persons, he has a direct line of access to the accused persons who have not been arrested in this matter from the Samheji group of companies because he's the one who used to direct them to divert those funds to other private entities. So if the court has a holistic approach, and I submit that this is what is required in this particular case for the court to have a holistic approach at all the evidence, the relationships between the accused persons, and if there can be, there's a likelihood of them being influenced to interfere if the court takes a holistic approach of the evidence in this particular case, your lordships, um, we respectfully submit that there is a likelihood of this particular appellant, apart from his own interference, of him being sent as well to interfere in this particular matter. I also just want to highlight
Why? Yes, Your Lordship. Um, or oh, is the court going to the to the judgment? I just wanted to know about the money in, in Dubai and the access to the Dubai people. Because speaking for myself, I I became a bit unsettled when I heard that um, certain amounts of money were being mentioned in the in the record, and yet there was no connection between the the appellants three, four, and four, five, six, and, and the Dubai people. Yes, you Would you like to speak to that issue specifically? Um, let me deal with that. I'll deal with that by referring to the record itself. I just want to get to the record. I mean, the court will bear with me, Your Lordship. So I just want to get to the page. Okay, um, your lordship, it appears to start from page 2,756, 2,756. Reference was made to 2,756, paragraph 1, when uh, that issue was being interrogated. On which page was it about him? Um, I think he was talking volume 23. Uh, he was referring to the judgment of the the court. Yes, your lordship. Uh, that appears in volume 23, uh, pages 2756, and was referring to paragraph 1 of that particular page trying to say they are talking about monies that were in existence but there was no link between those monies and and dubai yes i think that was the argument um when that was referred to unfortunately i was not looking at the record i was looking at the decision itself attached on the uh, notice but my colleague is still looking for the for the page i cannot find the corresponding page that is reflected on my uh, on the one that I rely on your lordship as was well that you see with the introduction of those statements in the next the second judgment then it meant that in fact um, it was prejudicial to all the accused in that regard and this explains why they were saying we should disregard the second judgment. Yes, Your Lordship. Uh, perhaps to save time, I do not have the page numbers, but I know the page before that. I can just, if the court will allow me. It's not the same. Do you have a um, Your Lordship, I have the page that was read by the court where it indicates that I'm that satisfied that the likelihood of the applicants that the applicants will, if released on bail, suppress or distort the evidence relating to the sum of money is real? Oh, no. My apologies. I, I have the wrong, the wrong page number, your lordship. I'm just trying to find that page because I want to properly answer the court 
on that issue. I just want to get the right page. Remember you are colleagues need to be working together. Yeah, uh, thank you. So about that it. you are able to assist the court to do justice. Yes, there are thousands of pages in this record. It's better if the correct page. Which which volume are you referring to? Um at volume twenty-three, your lordship of twenty-six. 23. I the the issue is I've made notes on a different judgment, the one which is attached to the to the notice. See, Your Lordship, I think just to save time, from the time that I read that particular provision, um, the finding of the court, the court merely referred to the applicants. Unfortunately, the court did not specify which applicants um, would interfere with the funds in Dubai. But we know prior to that, the court had taken into consideration in this judgment that there is evidence to that effect that there were funds which were paid to Dubai. And we know from the evidence that is led, the persons who were involved, and that does not include um, the fifth applicant, the sixth and the fourth, fifth, and sixth applicants, your lordships. I just want to highlight that from the judgment itself, it's not clear which applicants are referred to. It merely states that the applicants. Your Lordship, looking at the finding of the court on that particular page, that there's a likelihood of the applicants um, interfering that sum of money, um, it in no way refers, as I've indicated, to applicants four, five, and six. And we know from the evidence that was laid before court that this primarily relates to the first three applicants and the charges in terms of the indictment, that is also before court as an exhibit, is in respect of the first three applicants, not the last four applicants. So, for the... bail to uh, applicants uh, four, five, and six, if there was no evidence relating to their connection? Your, lord, your lordships, in so far as the appellants 4, 5, and 6, it's not only limited to the interference in so far as the funds in Dubai are concerned. We've also dealt with other forms of interference or likelihood of interference in respect of those applicants. Not phones as well. Yes, because they, 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 no, no, for the fourth applicant, it's with regard to the consultancy agreement, the evidence that we just dealt with now that he wanted the witness to sign. That is the evidence that relates to him. Um, I'll still come to the other issues of the funds or investments, as they were called, in Angola, because those are the relevant ones when it comes to the um, fourth, fifth, no, fourth and yes, fifth applicants in this particular matter. Uh, how many minutes? In fact, you've only got five minutes because of the 15 minutes you wasted this morning, <laughs> so move on. You have five minutes left. <laughs> um, okay, your lordships, I'll, I'll move on. Is it five minutes that I have, your lordship? How much time do I have left? Well, move on, move on a bit, but I'm not, I mean, you must finish by four, this old case. So uh, move uh, on, uh, move on. As it plays a court about ships. Um, I just want to highlight, insofar as this matter is concerned, um, I've already partly touched on the fifth applicant, as from the statement of Mr. Camano, that he was working with the fourth applicant, contacting the witness in this particular case. Um, the issues of likelihood of interference have also been dealt with in the heads of arguments extensively. 
that there is in fact a likelihood of interference taking into conduct his um, contacts with that particular witness. And we know from the evidence that has been laid, and they don't dispute it themselves, especially the fifth and the sixth applicants, in relation to the Novanam group of companies, that the invoices that they wrote for those for payment from Novanam, they never provided any services. They were merely instructed by the fourth appellant to write those invoices, and they were paid for services not rendered. So we know from having a holistic view of the evidence in this particular case that they are also capable of following instructions from the fifth appellant who was in actual fact sending the fifth appellant to do his bidding while he was in custody and furthermore your lordship we know from the evidence that was late that the sixth appellant mr mapopi with regard to the dried fish he was requested by the members of the acc to produce evidence of procurement of that dried fish. And what does he do? He produces an invoice to the SEC. That invoice is dated 2020. We know that cannot be the case because the dried fish was procured in 2016. So it's a false invoice. And it's not disputed furthermore that the entity reflected on that invoice, Flamingo Commodity Supplies, is a non-existent entity. So if the court takes this into consideration, it's very likely that this is a person who is capable of generating false information. We know from the evidence that has been laid, having a holistic view of the evidence, Mr. Hatuilipi, that's what he tends to do, the second applicant. He wants people to generate documents, false documents, to justify the commission of these offenses. I mean, it's very likely for this accused persons to do that as well. I also just want to highlight that, in, especially in this particular case, where we have a very strong Pumafaki case against the accused persons in this matter, and the sentence is most likely going to be a lengthy sentence which will be imposed, a custodial sentence. That will be an inducement, a very strong inducement for them to interfere with investigations in this matter. Um, moreover, The voice. I agree with Maron Detson. Yes, I hear the voice. It's going low. I'll, I'll raise it again, Your Lordship. It's exhausting speaking for hours. <laughs> yes, I just want to highlight that on the issues of interference, the court was correct in finding that there is a likelihood of interference by the accused persons because it, it does not matter to these accused persons, whether you provided a statement, whether you've collected the exhibits, because insofar as this syndicate is concerned, they'll even approach the investigating officers in their own case to release exhibits. If they can do that in investigating officers, really, what are witnesses to, to, to the members of the syndicate? Um, your Lordships, I think now, let me just move on to another aspect. Um, I think the one that was of interest before my time runs out, the issues of public interest and interest of the administration of justice. Of what? Uh, public interest. Oh. Interest of the public. Why do you want to go there? Because the court of court didn't go there. Yes, Your Lordship, because at the end of the day, when this court is seized with this matter, it, it depends if the court finds that the decision was wrong. <laughs> I don't know what the court's finding is going to be. But if the court finds the decision was wrong, then the court ought to give a decision that should have been given by the High Court. Um, in instance, that is the only reason as to why the issue of interest of the public um, has been raised to your lordships. Um, as a starting point, I'm, I'll be very brief. I know the time is not with me. 
it was re requested from the court on the definition of the interest of the public. Um, not sure if the court still wants that to be addressed. I can address it quickly. Yes, I can quickly address that, Your Lordship. Because the starting point is Section 61 of the Criminal Procedure Act. It makes provision that if the court is satisfied, the accused is not going to abscond or interfere with the investigations or witnesses. In the opinion of the court, it can still deny bail if it's not in the interest of the public or in the interest of the administration of justice. Now, when it comes to the issues of the interest of the public, I think that concept, it speaks for itself. It's what's in the interest of the public in so far as any particular case is concerned. Generally, if the court has regard to the Charlotte Helena Botta matter, in that particular case, the court had outlined the factors which would be indicative of the interest of the public. And the three factors which were outlined therein include public outcry. It's not a deciding factor, but it's something taken in consideration if it's genuine and spontaneous, but it's not a deciding factor, but it must be taken in consideration. Um, pronouncements of the court, that was another aspect that should be taken in consideration because the pronouncements of the courts, the judgment would reflect what constitutes public interest. Because this concept would differ from case to case and the courts have to define what public interest is or the interest of the public. And apart from that, legislation as well would indicate as to the interest of the public. And in this particular case, we have the provisions of section 61 of the Criminal Procedure Act, which was concerned with accused persons who have been absconding, despite them having satisfied the court that they are not going to abscond and they still abscond. So section 61 was enacted for that purpose and that is the reflection of the interest of the public. We have the provisions of POCA, we have the provisions of the ACC Act, those will all be reflected in the interest of the public. Now, just to cut matters short, your lordships, when you are dealing with the interest of the public, is in nature of fact a lucid concept. Generally, the examples that are given is that the interest of the public, for example, in a matter where an accused person faces serious charges, let's say there are serial killings which are alleged against this person. He satisfied the court, I'm not going to abscond. He satisfied the court, I'm not going to interfere. Should that person be released? No, it's not in the interest of the public because it poses a danger to the public. Now, in so far as the interest of the public is concerned. In the matter of Charlotte Helena Botta, also in the matter of duplices, I believe also in the, in the Gustavo Meta Supreme Court judgment, the courts also touched on this. Yes, where I, your lordships, just for purposes of time, I'll not have time to quickly look at the specific page. But in instance, what the court said was this, that even if the accused convinces the court that it's unlikely or improbable, they're going to abscond or interfere with witnesses. But in cases where there's a prima facie case against that person and the conviction, likelihood of conviction is high, if the court is of the view there's a reasonable possibility they will interfere, then in, in, in accordance with the provisions of section 61, which has given them wider powers, they can, in fact, now refuse bail on that basis. Um, but in so far as this case is concerned, the interest of the public is also quite clear. And I just want to touch on the question that was posed um, regarding the funds in Dubai. Because we have members of the syndicate who have utilized the public offices to benefit from the resources of Namibia. The funds which were transferred to Dubai these are derived from quotas meant for governmental objectives for the benefit of the Namibian people. Now, is it in the interest of the public to release the appellants on bail in this particular case when those funds have not been accounted for? They have not informed the court what has happened to those funds. So the appellants are going to be released on bail and they benefit from public funds which have not been returned to the state coffers to benefit the public. So is that in public interest? I respectfully submit not your lordship. And the same applies for the other um, 
appellants in this case, uh, the fourth appellant and the sixth appellant, who testified, and we know from the evidence that was laid that the funds which were received, which were an issue in this particular case, were transferred to their entities. And what they testified to the court is that these funds were invested in Angola. And from the evidence of the fifth appellant, Mr. Shidufonia, if he's released, they'll continue their project in Angola. He's just being held back because he's in custody. We are talking about public funds here. So it, it, these funds could be used for the development of schools, hospitals. We know the state that these are in. So really, is it in the interest of the public to release these persons on bail for them to continue benefiting from public funds individually? No. And that is the whole concept of the interest of the public. And I think maybe just to get a better definition of this, your lordship, it would also be appropriate just to have a, in terms of the rules of interpretation, just to have a look at the ordinary dictionary meaning of what constitutes a public interest. That would be the starting point. But these matters that I've just highlighted, your lordship, is just to illustrate the public interest, the interest of the public in this particular case. We are not merely just saying yeah, that no, there was a demonstration, that's the interest of it. No. That is one factor, definitely, it has to be taken into consideration. It is a factor, but it must be considered with other factors. And that is public interest. Um, and I think just to close off on the concept of public interest, Your Lordship, I just want to highlight that when dealing with public interest, one very important factor, as I indicated in the Charlotte Helena Porter matter, that the court must look at the judgments or decisions that have been delivered um, defining public interest. And one of these definitions that have been that can be found in our judgments, uh, some of the judgments are cited in there, is that if there's a strong prima facie case against an accused person, and the likelihood of conviction is high, the likelihood of imprisonment is also high, then it will not be in the interest of the public to have the persons released on bail. Um, Yes, I, I see the court is you finished. Ah, no, I can push you. I can push your lordship. I'll, no, <laughs> I'll no. comply with the court's order. No, no, the half pass, you'll be finished, and then each party will get quarter of an hour to be like. Uh, as it plays the court, your lordship. Um, and just to highlight, because now we are concerned with what decision that this court is going to give. We know Mr. Ngipunya's bill application was a new bill, was a bill application on new facts. So really, the decision of the magistrate's court was challenged in the high court. It was dismissed. The high court found it was a proper decision that there's a likelihood of him interfering and it's not in the interest of the administration of justice and public. So that stands. That decision stands, Your Lordship. Um, I just want to... Now I'm concluding, Your Lordship. I'm going to stick with the time. Um, yes. Highlights. <laughs> no, no I'll, I'll conclude, Your Lordship. Let me just quickly touch on, on one aspect, one other aspect that uh, was raised. And this is in relation to the, to the ACC, the powers of the ACC to investigate cases. Um, that regard was, uh, what is the... What is the intended um, objective with raising that point? Are you saying, is it being said that the evidence uh, collected by the unauthorized uh, investigator will be inadmissible and therefore it will not be able to speak to the issue of the seriousness of the crime in question? What do what, what you understand to be the purpose of that attack? And perhaps related to that, is that not a matter that will actually much more conveniently be raised at the trial when shooting down the evidence to say this evidence is inadmissible? Is that a matter for bail? Uh, not at all, Your Lordship. And in actual fact, that was also the view that was held in the matter of
Grad Noble versus the state. Um, it also forms part of the record um, exhibits, volume two of three. Should be the last judgment. There was an issue of the validity of the search and the lawfulness of the warrants in this particular. And this is what the court said. As earlier stated, it was the appellant's argument that the court misdirected itself in not determining the above mentioned issues. Bell application is not a trial but an inquiry. The court Aquo at this stage is tasked to have due regard to the evidence adduced before it as a whole and make a finding whether the state has established a prima facie case against the appellant. If these issues have to be decided during the bail inquiry, this may amount to prejudging the issues to be decided during the trial, which in turn may have an adverse effect on the criminal process. Um, Grant Noble versus the state is the last is? case in volume two of the state's exhibit. What, where is, is the it's bundle of authorities. Yes, Who's bundle of authorities? Um, the state's bundle of authorities, volume two of three. Yeah. Um, I just want to highlight volume two of three, your lordship, the last judgment in that bundle. Two last judgments. Yes, I just want to highlight what I understand from their arguments is simply this. If those charges of money laundering and racketeering, those will fall away. But in so far as the charges of fraud, um, Charges under the yes, theft, uh, charges under the Anti-Corruption Act, those will still stand. But from the arguments, they consider the charges of money laundering and racketeering to be more serious charges than fraud, which is not the case. Because in terms of Section 61 of the CPA, money laundering and fraud do not appear there. It's only fraud and theft um, which, are, which will be affected under Section 61. Moreover, looking at the indictment, those charges of racketeering and money laundering, they are derived from the same facts. Um, with the charges of fraud and theft. So really, if there was something completely separate that we are looking at separate fate, I'd understand that, yes, okay, fine. Maybe the most serious charges have pulled out. No, they don't. It's derived from the same facts, the same amounts are involved. So really, the story remains is serious, even in the absence of those um, charges. Uh, Your Lordship, I know my time is up, so let me just conclude by saying that the state respectfully submits that in so far as this matter is concerned, Looking at the final decision of the court denying bail on the basis that it did, that it had not been the interest of the Ministry of Justice and the selectivity of interference, the court was in actual fact correct in its finding of lordship. Um, I think, let me just see if there's anything else, if the court will allow me. Uh, yes, your lordship, that is the state's argument. Mr. Dumbezi, Mr. Sony. Oh, sorry. I don't intend, I hope I don't have to take all 15 minutes. May I raise the first issue raised by our learned friends for the state, namely that our notice of appeal does not include the issue of onus and I know they've put it at a very narrow level. I, I just point this out because it is a major part of our case because at paragraph 13 of the notice of appeal we say significantly the learned judge declined to grant bail not because there, were, there was evidence justifying a further deprivation of a significant fundamental right, namely liberty, but because the appellants had failed to discharge the owners allegedly resting on them. With respect, it is not so that in a bail application an accused bears the onus of proving that he ought to be released on bail. The learned judge's ruling to the contrary const constitutes a material error of law. Now, what we have done in considering the matter after the uh, notice of appeal was filed is refined the position so that we say in respect of this application the the uh, the court committed a material error of law now on that basis we cannot be with respect non-suited 
for putting our claim wider than it really is. We are not expanding the basis. We are, in fact, limiting the basis on which we rely on the material error of law. So we submit that on that issue, the question of our being able to persist with uh, the uh, onus issue remains intact. My learned friends have also indicated that they had led evidence which was undisputed about alleged interference or non-compliance with, with certain matters. I just want to, and I'm not going to be long about this, let me deal first with the allegations against uh, the second appellant. Now, the allegation against him is that he gave money to somebody, 250,000 rand, and we must remember this is all done while he is in prison, where he would get 250,000 rand is never explained. But this issue was specifically dealt with, with the investigator who gave evidence. And it appears at volume 18, page 20052. Uh, uh, Well, it, it's page 2051, where Mr. Kanyangele concedes that after he, well, th there's two points about this. Mr. Kanyangele himself didn't investigate that matter. Somebody from the ACC reported to him. The matter is taken to court. This person pleads guilty a second charge against him is dropped. The issue, though, is it is put to Mr. Kanyangera, look, an allegation is made. You are investigating the second appellant. Did you ask him for a version? Did you say to him, look, this allegation has been made? It's a serious allegation. It's going to materially affect your case. He says, no, I didn't. I didn't ask him anything. That's what he says at page 2051. And then as regards the case itself, the, Mr. Kanyangela admits that that person is a self-confessed uh, uh, convict. But he doesn't, on the basis of what he is told there, come to Mr. Uh, and say, this is an allegation made against you. But what is important about the approach of the state is that if your lordships look at page, uh, volume one, page seven, this is this first, uh, the second appellant's uh, affidavit in support of his bail application. He says at page, uh, sorry, it's page six, paragraph four. He says, I place on record that the state has charged me in another matter which is pending in the magistrate's court, and it is this matter. Should that matter come to, to proceed to trial, I, intended ple I intend pleading not guilty to the charges, and I record that I deny any wrongdoing as alleged. As a matter of fact, as is evident from the disclosed documents of the Anti-Corruption Commission, I am in fact the targeted victim of a failed plot to extort monies from me. Whilst I have not attached such documents to this application, my legal practitioners will have such at hand during the bail hearing should the court wish to peruse them. So that's not the approach of a person who wants to hide something. He wants to deal with it. But 
No, that invitation is not accepted. But today our learned friends come and say there's been no answer to it. Well, with respect, uh, Justices, there is a complete answer to that. And all we have is an allegation of a convicted person, a person convicted by his own mouth. Can I then turn to the allegation made against the first appellant as regards the so-called extradition regarding Dubai? At paragraph, uh, sorry, at volume 18, that evidence, incidentally, is based on a report compiled by Deloitte, and that report has already been referred to. And I just want to mention two or three aspects of that. At page 2045, Deloitte say in the, in the report that as there is no consultations with the persons of interest, which include all the appellants, uh, this report may not reflect full information of all relevant documentation and transactions. Information used for the purpose of this report has been obtained from documents from the ACC. It says, our review was dependent on the completeness and integrity of the documents we received from the ACC. Now, as regards that report contained what is called Dubai searches, a, a section that is contained, uh, that is titled Dubai searches. And Mr. Kanyangela, when asked about this, is asked, that report was not conducted by you. He says, no, I, it was not. And, and then he says at uh, page 2046, now, did you ask the first appellant about this? this? Because Deloitte's were not allowed to talk to the first appellant. But Mr. Kenyangela says, no, I didn't go to him. And then it's, the following is put. Had you gone to him, this is what Mr. Uh, Shangala would have said. He says, among the matters that were contained in the information given during the various proceedings, the court proceedings, and in affidavits, was that there were certain dealings that we had taken place in Dubai. As a lawyer, he was checking various aspects relating to the law in Dubai in relation to Namibia and what information Namibia would be able to get from them. You are not in a position to dispute that, are you? He says, no, I'm not in a position to dispute that. Now, that's the totality of the evidence that's on record relating to this matter. But the third point is, again, this has nothing to do with interfering with evidence. And as has been pointed out, the fact that phones were found in their possession is not a basis to say they were interfering because there is no proof of interference. May I address one issue that I've not been asked to address, and I know I'm forcing myself onto the court on this issue, and this is the issue of public interest. Obviously, the issue would arise only if your lordships come to the conclusion that in respects of appellants one, two, and three, the, um, the decision of the court I call was wrong. The lordships come to the conclusion that the, based on whatever onus you accept, that the, the three appellants uh, are entitled to bail, but on condition that the public interest is not adversely affected. Now, may I make this point? I made it much earlier, <coughs> starting with the 
decision, I mean, with the the judgment of the court are co. Go back to the introduction. He says, an accused person cannot be kept in detention pending his trial. The presumption of the law is that he is innocent until his guilt has been established. The court will therefore ordinarily grant bail to an accused person unless this is likely to prejudice the ends of justice. That, I remind the court, is prior to section 61 being introduced. So even at the time of Atchison, the notion of the ends of justice not being prejudiced was there. And the submission we make is that when one considers the question of public interest having regard to uh, the totality of factors, the, four factor, the, the, the first three factors are is the, is the accused likely to stand his trial? The second, is he likely to interfere? And the third is, what prejudice is to the public? And in deciding whether or not that qualification, as it is now put in Section 61, the public interest requires otherwise, what the court has to take into account are factors other than those. And that would, for example, depend, and it's easy to say, where there is a domestic violence matter that a person would, would in some ways interfere with the person whom he's been acting violently against. If it concerned a pedophile, and the pedophile met, uh, uh, ticked all three boxes, are the children safe in those circumstances? In a case like this, assuming the, the appellants were, were to remain in their positions, then is the public interest if they were in those positions? Well, obviously it's not in the public interest that persons who are facing such charges should remain in public office. The question though is, should they, be remain, should they be kept in custody? And the question and, and the answer with respect must be in line with the Constitution. What the public would expect of the court is a proper consideration of all the matters, including the reasonable expectations of the public. The reasonable expectations and the reasonable expectations of the public must be that the provisions of the constitution the provisions of the law are not breached to the point where in attempting to protect the public as it were a decision is reached that is antithetical to what the constitution expects so we submit that it is a wide discretion afforded to the court that would depend on the particular circumstances of the court or of the case. And to the extent that the public expects that this court, despite its, its, its best endeavors to to find reasons not to hold the pub, uh, not to hold the uh, the the uh, appellants in custody, that it does so, that would not be just because it would be a betrayal of the trust that the constitution reposes in members of the judiciary. So we submit that at the end of the day, the decision on public interest cannot be so far away from what ordinary reasonable people expect judges to do in protecting their interests. And we submit that in a case where the accused have been in custody for three years now, it is not 
in the public interest that they be kept in custody. Because today it may well be these accused, tomorrow it may be other accused, and that undermines the entire justice system. It must be this fair play that the English judges of old used to talk about. Those are my suggestions. Yes, Mr. Patel. Your Lordships, I intend not to take my entire 15 minutes, which I'm entitled to. Uh, my contentions that I made earlier, especially on the law of the facts, remain untested and uncontested. You will have noticed that even when the state, despite the best endeavors of my learned friend, who is one of the most gifted legal practitioners, he couldn't find a reason either in the record anywhere why Mwapopi uh, was found not to be a suitable candidate for bail. I'm talking about appellate number, five, number six. I also accept and I'm delighted with the concession that came from the state submission that the judgment itself erroneously concluded. The judgment concluded erroneously yeah. that appellates four, five, and six were culpable in respect of the money in Dubai, the four million US dollars. That was not their own baby to kiss. They had nothing to do with that. And I submit that on those crowns, and the ones that I made as well earlier in my submissions in chief, they remain sustainable that the court of course judgment was and remains an injustice to appellants four, five, and six. You will know that in the heads of arguments of the state, even in the oral submissions, some kind of attempt was made pertaining to the complaint about the admission of appellate four based on new facts. But not much was made in argument. Your Lordships, this creates a difficulty for us. We brought an appeal. We were forced by the requirements of the rules of engagement to set out what exactly are the reasons why we say the judgment of the court of court must be assailed by this court. They looked at those crowns. We know that lately it's a requirement of this court that the respondent cannot simply say, I oppose. They must also set out the crowns why they are opposing. There was no cross appeal whatsoever from the state relating to whether it was improper, incorrect or otherwise to admit the application of appellate number four based on new facts. But now for the first time in the heads of arguments, we see this argument, which we say is neither here nor there, is not relevant. The one that the court of court could perhaps have made an error by admitting the fourth appellant bail application based on new facts. And therefore, that's why we say, we submit that the lordship should not even be bothered to, to deal with that aspect. It was never an issue and there is no cross appeal from the state. We also put forward that the issue of backdating, if the court drew an, inf an inference that this agreement, when you look at it, the totality of it leads to an inference that the intention was for it to be backdated, then say so. But when the court says there was evidence that he was, the witness was requested to backdate an agreement, that's an issue of fact. And we say that was not correct. No matter how from which angle you look at it, it was not correct. So the interference that was relating to this witness statement, moreover emphasis being placed on backdating of agreements, contaminated the, the line of reasoning. And that's why we say this honorable court will be entitled not to, uh, not to rely on the, the findings of the court of court in that regard. Number two, or th the last point that I want to make quickly, there is a submission that is being made which completely misses the context that my clients 
or the fourth appellant was simply getting instructions. He demonstrated that he was always following instructions of certain accused, co-accused. This, argue, this argument, we have seen it in the High Court, but we also take issue with it because it misses the context within which the instructions were executed. He was an employee of the company. There were these gazetted legal instruments, including the Marine Resources, Marine Education. Yes, Resources Act. There were also these agreements, a plethora of agreements that would be gazetted by the state detailing that once the government has made a determination that those are the, the governmental objectives, he had to follow them. He had no power whatsoever to delete that. So he could follow them because it was in the context of an employment relationship. He is no longer employed there. That is a fact. And the co-accused are also no longer occupying the positions that they were occupying. So there is no evidence that was left before the court of court that at any time after he has you know, he has been relieved of his uh, positions, and as well as the other co-accused. He has followed any of the instructions from those people. And so for, therefore, the, the, the argument, we, we say, my Lord, that it's, 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 not, uh, it's not sustainable. We also want to clear one thing, because although our learned friend was, you know, um, once or twice tried to, to, to specify this, the issue of the cell phones that were found, none of these appellant four, five, and six were ever found with an illegal, unlawful communication device, including a cell phone or SIM cards, nothing of the sort, so that we clarify it so that we don't want the, this to live in the mind of the court that the same brush, uh, because our learned friends have the responsibility to the facts. When they say that certain instruments were found, they have to exclude my clients from from those findings. We submit that earlier on I had to deal with the question of um, public interest. But I emphasize that having looked at the authorities, your lordships, it seems like even while public interest or interest of the public is in the mind of the court, the overriding constitutional obligation of our courts pertaining to the presumption of innocence is never too far. It's a balancing act, and we submit that the court will have to consider all these factors. At the end, is it fair to keep a man that may ultimately be exonerated in jail for the proceedings where over 320 witnesses are going to be testifying? We submit that the presumption of innocence, which, as was stated, although is a bit dangerous, and I accept this, your lordship, that often when one comes to the apex court, it can be quite dangerous to cite the, the, the cases of, um, of, of a high court. Um, but we, we, we agree with the submission because the, 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 the observation of the court here, because it has not been upset, at least on the basis of what we have cited here. In the case of S versus Jonah, we have referred to this in paragraph 203 of our heads, because from basically paragraph 201, that's where we deal with interest of the public and interest of the administration of justice. Where the court said the following, pertaining to the granting of bail, it must be, however, be borne in mind that any court seized with the problem of whether or not to release a detainee on bail must approach the matter from the perspective that freedom is a precious right protected by our constitution. Such freedom should only be lawfully curtailed if the interest of justice so require. The fundamental objective of the institution of bail in a democratic society based on freedom is to maximize personal liberty. The proper approach to a decision in a bail application is that the court will always grant bail where possible and will lean in favor of and not against the liberty of the subject, provided that it is clear that the interests of justice will not be prejudiced thereby. The interest of the public justice, Frank, uh, my submission on that note, difficult concept as it is, 
is that people that are prosecuted for crimes or that have committed crimes must be prosecuted. One may add, be prosecuted timelessly. And if convicted, they must serve their sentence. But where there are other factors, such as bail that have to be considered, including the presumption of innocence, it's in the interest of the public that those also must be given. Only those people that don't deserve to be admitted to bail must be refused bail. In fact, giving the appellants bail does not say that the court is pronouncing itself on their guilt and on their innocence. Those are matters for the trial court. And we... That, Mr. Tobin? Yes. So, we have no further submissions or else those are... Uh, our, our submissions in reply. We believe that our case is still intact. Wherefore, we pray for the relief that we have advanced in our heads of arguments. As it pleases the court. Stella. Yes, I just, it leaves me just to thank all counsel for the heads of argument and the oral argument. We will obviously have to consider the matter, but further, and we will do that. And once we, once that is. Once the judgment is ready, we will know. We let the parties know. So the, uh, at, the judgment is reserved, and the parties will be notified when it's ready to be handed down. Thank you. The court will adjourn.